listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. It's back, big time, the coronavirus. Now thousands of people are reportedly catching it every day. 149 in Britain are on ventilators already. Are we headed back to March? Are we headed back to general lockdown? Can we survive if we do? And what about all the people who are dying because they can't or won't go into hospital because of the fear and loathing of the coronavirus? Me, I'm being alert because there's thousands of them maybe shooting over my head. We'll be talking this evening about whether or not we are headed back to those dark days and if we should go back to those dark days. And clickety-click 66, this is episode 66 of officially the biggest show of its kind on the planet. One million people watched or listened to last week's mother of all talk shows. I'm inferring the 300,000 listeners, seems reasonable on FM, AM and online, but I can prove that more than 700,000 people watched this show last week. If you are one of the watchers, share, please, right now with all of your friends and contacts because this is going to be really the mother of all talk shows, the open university of the airwaves. There are no tuition fees and you are encouraged to speak back to the teacher. A radio show with pictures, what's not to love? Fasten your seatbelts. It's the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. Can you imagine episode 66 of a radio show with pictures mounted on a shoestring, which only happened because of my cockamamie dismissal by a local radio station in London, now has an audience of one million people across the globe. More than 700,000 of them in black and white, in print, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on Instagram, and on Twitch. This is a phenomenon. This is truly a global university, and I'm honored that you are trusting me as your professor. And in return, I promise that we will deal, continue to deal, with the subjects that nobody else deals with and in a way that no one else ever will. You're all paying the BBC if you've got a television, that is. You'll go to prison if you don't. Or you're paying through advertising if you're only watching commercial television. Thanks to RT and Sputnik, you're not paying for this at all. Although we'll be starting next month a midweek mother of all talk shows, that you will have to pay one dollar or whatever the sterling equivalent is next month, probably 75 or 76 pence. And that will be the mother of all talk shows truly unleashed, unplugged. Not that we're censored in any way here, but we will be, I don't know, more zany, more edgy, and we'll deal with the very, very sharpest of issues. So if you're one of those watching, please, I urge you now, please share it with everyone because I quite like it up here on this cloud as you've probably already inferred. Now the coronavirus pandemic not only isn't going away, it's coming back. It's coming back in a serious way. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the death toll that we experienced at one stage in Britain, though we deliberately concealed it, we covered it up, uh, we were losing 1,000 people a day for a period in Britain. Now we're not. And despite the massive spike in cases, doubling every week, we will not necessarily go back to that level of death toll, but we might. What if we do? What's going to happen in the economy if we plunge back into general lockdown? Will we even be allowed to go to work? You know my view, as the apocryphal Irishman said when asked directions to Dublin, he said, I wouldn't have started from here. Well, I wouldn't. I told you right from the beginning what we should have been doing and how long we should have been doing it. And the government did very differently. We locked down too late. We lifted the lockdown too early. We did not test and track and trace. We forced people back to work in unsafe conditions but our economy fell by 20% in one quarter. The biggest single fall since the British economy existed. That fall cannot be afforded again. So what are we going to do now? Everybody knows about the chaos in testing. At least everyone on this side of the Atlantic knows that our government I cannot be trusted to go out for a loaf, never mind to safeguard the National Health Service and the public health of 65 million people. You wouldn't trust them to go out to the shops for you. If you were in any doubt about that, uh, then you haven't read the excerpts of Diary of an MP's Wife, which perfectly sums up the caliber of the British political class today. This tome, this diary is serialized everywhere. I'm reading about it everywhere I turn. It's written by the nondescript wife of an entirely nondescript member of parliament who was an entirely nondescript minister briefly in David Cameron's government. His name is Hugo Swire. I forget his wife's name. Her book spells out the banality, the utter nondescriptness of the people running our country. It can be summed up by her relaying, not denied by David Cameron, that as he took her for a walk with her husband in the gardens of Chequers, the country home of the Prime Minister, the Eton and Oxford educated Prime Minister of Great Britain said to his friend's wife, I'd like to take you in those bushes and give you one. Boris Johnson at a number 10 Downing Street dinner, complete with candelabra and white linen and silver spoons, shouted across the table, at the aforementioned Shugo Swire, then a minister in the British Foreign Office, God help us. Hey, Shugo, did you shag Jerry Hall? That's the kind of people running our country. That's the kind of people who were running it under David Cameron. It's the kind of people that are running it under Boris Johnson. They all went to the same school. They all went to the same university. They have the same cultural level, which is on ground level, if not on basement level. They all talk to women like that. They all care only about being in power. As another ex-Foreign Office Minister, George Walden, says in the papers today, these people come from such a bubble, such a tiny sliver of the British society that they literally have no idea, which is why they thought Brexit would never pass. They actually have no idea what life looks like, sounds like, is like 
in the country as a whole. They live their lives from school, through university, and into the professions on a cloud. Uh, but it is a cloud uh, that is about to open. And Britain is about to face economic and political challenges which have not been matched since the summer of 1940, when our brave pilots, together with our Commonwealth and other allied pilots, in that battle of Britain, saved this country from fascist invasion and being subsumed in the Third Reich of adult Hitler. We have not faced a crisis like that until now. It's not that the coronavirus can be necessarily compared to Hitler, uh, but it could be if the pandemic were to go up several gears, which it could do, if the economy were to collapse by another 20% in this coming quarter, uh, then the threat to our national life, our livelihood, and the well-being of our people uh, would be existential. The Britain that would come out the other end of that, if there is a coming out at the other end of that, would be almost unthinkable. There could be a collapse of social peace in this country. There could be a revolution in this country. Probably not a good revolution. But the first casualty of it will undoubtedly be Boris Johnson, who is posted missing in dispatches. He is simply not on top of his brief, neither of the economy nor of the public health situation. In fact, he personally has made it far worse. His government handing out a hundred billion pounds or more in public money to private companies who have utterly failed to carry out the projects for which they were paid have put us in this potential disaster now where nobody can get a test, let alone be tested and tracked and traced. We cannot gather in our homes in more than six, but we can sit in a pub with 600, but only till 10 o'clock. We are paid to eat out just two weeks ago, if that, eat out to help out, which may well have accelerated the spread again of this virus. They're even letting people into rugby games, but not football ones, limited crowds, but crowds nonetheless. None of this makes any sense, is my point. None of this has any logic. And we have a crisis in Britain of numbers, of statistics. Nobody knows whether they can believe the statistics. Nobody knows if they can believe the scientists. Now, all of this is true of Britain, and it's true with knobs on in the United States of America, where anybody who believed the government, anybody who believed the statistics, anybody who believed the science would need their head examined. Uh, this is a state that spent the last four years talking about Russia Gate while their country fell apart and was set on fire, either by global warming in California or by rioters or agent provocateur or a mix of the both in city to shining, burning city. This is a country which is summed up by the contest Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. This is a country that doesn't actually know if this November's election not only can be trusted, but will not lead to a civil war, will not lead to the crowd of MAGA supporters on the White House lawn being cut down by the US Marines. This catastrophe of the neoliberal blonde-headed leader scenario is facing both of our countries, Britain and the United States. 
and in the very, very near future. London might be locked down next week. I might be forbidden by law to come to work. Don't worry about that. We'll find a solution if that were to happen. But the point I'm making is these grave existential challenges are taking place when both of our countries are led by idiots. Chamberlain was a disgrace and a pizza. He was a total miserable failure. But I suspect he was not an idiot. We are led by idiots. And there's no Churchill waiting in the wings in either country. Think about that. I do. I think about it all the time. And lastly, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency. Now, Max Kaiser is a big friend of mine. So you'd think I'd know everything about cryptocurrency. But actually, everything Max ever told me about it went right over my head. Maybe it did yours also, although Max is on three times a week and has a very big and loyal audience. I'll be talking to an old friend of mine, David Lowe, in Glasgow, who runs a Scottish Bitcoin outfit. We'll talk about that. And he has the view that this could be the answer uh, to a separatist Scotland currency dilemma, whereby the best they can hope for, it seems, is to be like Panama, using American dollars, whilst not controlling them and certainly not being able to print them. All of that is coming up over the next three hours. We'll be talking to the absolutely inimitable Garland Nixon in just a few minutes about all things Americana. But I chose this poll that's out now because I could not believe my eyes last night when the BBC led with the news that a judge that I had never heard of in the United States of America had passed away at the age of 87. In the midst of this economic and public health crisis in Britain, the BBC chose to lead with the death of a woman aged 87 who was a judge, apparently, in a court in America. And so we're asking, why was the death of an American judge a leading item on the BBC? Is it A, she was a liberal, B, to damage Trump, or C, because we have become the 51st state of the United States of America? It's all coming up. Get voting now on my Twitter feed at George Galloway. And share, share if you're watching right now, please. I like it up here as the host of the biggest show on the planet. I'll be right back. I'm out on patrol with my hunting party, making sure that the people of Britain are staying in more than groups of six, I mean five, I mean six. Less than seven, but more than five. That's six? Yes, six. Look, Prime Minister, over there! <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, bloody rapscallions! <laughs> Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Global higher education, with one of the world's best known iconoclasts. The mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway. Record numbers on Instagram and even bigger numbers this week than there were at this stage, 7.20 London time last week. So we are headed back to that mountaintop, but I'm asking you, please, 
If you're watching on Facebook, please share it. Bring another viewer, won't you? Now, the, uh, the poll is going well, uh, too. Uh, why was the death of an American judge a leading item on BBC? A, she was a liberal, 22%. B, to damage Trump, 43%. C, because we have become the 51st state of the union, 35%. Uh, but in response on social media, Alex says, because the BBC is obsessed with Trump's America, as does Lewis. He says the BBC have always been obsessed with all things American. Well, let's see. I'm obsessed with Garland Nixon's take on the US election and the ongoing civil strife in his country. And he joins me now, my old colleague and friend. Garland, thank you very much indeed for rejoining us. We had a great conversation a few weeks ago, uh, but things move on fast. Uh, the uh, coronavirus is uh, still cutting a swathe through your people. The economic crisis is even graver in your country than mine. But hey, we've both got a blonde-headed idiot as a leader. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let me start by correcting you that um, uh, the UK or the, the, uh, England certainly isn't the 50, 51st state because uh, states have reciprocal agreements for extradition here. So if that were the case, uh, if we were asking Julian you to send over Julian okay. Assange, yeah. which, which we shouldn't be, then certainly um, Harry Brown's killer would be headed back. So I don't know. What, maybe you guys are a colony. You certainly don't have the rights that another state would have. That's a very sobering uh, observation. Maybe I should amend that poll because we have become a colony of our former colony. Garland, uh, let's talk uh, the economy first. I'm fascinated by this evictions crisis. Basically, uh, your people have not been paying their rent or their mortgage. The landlords and the uh, mortgage holders, the mortgage lenders, have not been able to enforce uh, eviction on people until now. Now the landlords and the mortgage lenders have to do so because they are in hock to the banks with loans that they cannot pay. And the banks are foreclosing on the landlords and the landlords are foreclosing on the tenants. And soon we'll be back in the 1930s in Hooverville, in, in tent cities. Well, you know, the, the, the difference is in the 1930s, there weren't um, military grade arms spread all throughout the nation like they are now. You know, there are now, you know, people had maybe shotguns for and, and guns for shooting varmints with on their farms or now they've got, uh, you know, they've they've got. Uh, 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 military grade weapons everywhere. And what we're looking at is the dominoes that are falling for a failed state. On one end, uh, the economic end of it, you have the landlords that can't pay the banks and the the uh, the properties go into fault. And then of course, needless to say, the banks start running into trouble, but we already know they're okay because the government's gonna bail them out. But on the other side, we're looking at probably, I've heard numbers 27 to 30 million families or tenants being thrown out you add in the kids, you add in the extra people, and you probably have, what, 13, 14 percent of an entire nation being homeless? Think about that. You cannot have a, 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 a civilized and structured society if 12 or 13 percent of the people are wandering aimlessly around looking for food and things of that nature. And let me add this. People are not going to sit around and be hungry and starve. They will take some kind of uh, extra legal action, shall we say, be it breaking into stores or whatever. So we're moving in a direction. I, I, we're not a failed state yet, but if our um, if our leaders and I use that word guardedly, um, if our leaders do not take the correct action, which they seem incapable of, both politically and morally, now um, we're looking at a failed state physically, where you're going to have, you know, it's going to look like a dawn of the dead movie. Yes, but that's a very interesting point, because largely, not as much as we were led to believe, but largely the 1930s depression was endured by the poor. They had no weapons. Uh, they were beaten, browbeaten. Uh, but that's not going to happen again. The people will not go quietly into that good night of hunger and homelessness. 
Well, the, the other part of it is this. In the 1930s, I believe about 60 percent of or, or higher of the U.S. were still living in an agrarian society. So there were a lot of people that were already poor. One of the part, a big part of the New Deal was bringing modern amenities to some of the rural areas, people bringing people water and electricity and things of that nature. So they didn't have the things to miss that they have now. And believe it or not, if you talk to older people in the black community, um, basically who talk about their parents or grandparents during that time, what they'll say is most people in the black community didn't even know there was a depression because they were so poor, they were already living like there was a depression in America because we had apartheid. Now, what we have is people who are used, who are accustomed to a fairly high standard of living, and they are not going to be happy. Uh, I suspect that as, and let me add this, and we're moving into winter. If you've ever been to Chicago or Detroit, you are not going to survive in the open during the winter time. So we're looking at not just, this is not just a political issue. This is not just a financial issue. It's going to become a physical issue where we have to deal with people who are on the streets, who are angry, who are hungry, and who are armed in many, many instances. And, and, and I think we all know that's not going to turn out well. Well, now, in the midst of all of this, we've got a contest between a man who is barely alive, standing for the Democrats, and a man who is barely sane, standing for the Republicans, and nobody else. Nobody else can even get on the ballot. Not Jesse Ventura, who might be here and there, not the Green Party who might be here or there, but in any case, they're not in the debates, they're not in the national argument. What do people do when faced with two cheeks of the same backside like that, especially a backside as, well, unprepossessing as this one? Well, and the sad part about it is, you know, the the uh, the working class, the working poor, the poor uh, have a discussion about what our options are. But basically what we're looking at is we're looking at a battle between two factions of the ruling elite. And they've already both won. As far as the Democratic Party is, uh, you know, as far as their perspective of beating Trump, they say they want to beat Trump. But if their main priority was to beat Trump, really? You're running Joe Biden and you're going to convince me that your top priority is to is to is to beat Donald Trump. I don't think so. They've already accomplished their top priority, which was to beat Bernie Sanders. That's all that mattered. If Trump wins, they can still raise money. They still have their institution. They still have their power. And let's not forget that many of the many of the funders, many of the powerful people that support the Democratic Party made it painfully clear that if Joe, excuse me, that if uh, Bernie Sanders were the nominee, that they were going to jump over and vote for Trump. So the reality is the people who always win have already won, and they're playing us around the edges to see, you know, this is about when the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is going after a million dollars of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of money for their campaigns, which one gets the 350 and which one gets 650? Who gets the bigger bite of the pie? If you've got the president, if your party has the presidency, you get the a bigger pie, uh, bite of the pie. It's the same donors and they're playing the same game. So we're kind of caught at the bottom. Therefore, most Americans, I don't think, think there's going to, well, I'll put it like this. People who are paying attention do not expect a dramatic change in the event. In the, and I would even argue this, in the unlikely event that Joe Biden wins, because let's not forget, and this is critical, Joe Biden has to get through a, at least one debate I don't know how Joe Biden gets through a debate. First of all, I don't know how he gets through the average day, but to get through a debate, I don't see that happening. And uh, of course, his running mate is, uh, is uh, now describing the ticket as Harris-Biden rather than Biden-Harris. Well, you know, and I think she's probably of, of the of that entire group over there. She's probably the most honest one. I don't think anyone believes that Joe Biden is competent at this point to run, you know, a fast food restaurant, much less uh, much less. Um, the United States of America. The fact of the matter is that, in my opinion, they are exactly the same. She's a person with no history of, you know, running, of, of being a governor, of running anything, any, anything major. She was an AG, yes, but that's a different animal. But the fact of the matter is this. Both of those people are conduits for power. I don't think anyone who understands politics looks at them and thinks that they have an agenda that's going to be enacted over the next four to eight years. There is an agenda that will be enacted through them. They are a conduit 
conduit for the people who want to get some things done. So Biden, Harris, whatever, call it whatever you want to, but it's going to be the same neoliberal, neoconservative policies that gave us Trump. And most likely, if they win, it will get a worse Trump next time. Will they win? At this point, I'm going to say no, simply because I'm thinking, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, I'm looking at the debates and I say, I, I, I just think Joe Biden crashes and burns in the, in the debates. Unless I'm wrong, unless a lot of people are wrong, this guy is not um, cognitively competent to stand up against Donald Trump. And let's not forget, uh, when he went against Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders wouldn't take a bite out of his hide. Bernie Sanders kept, you know, calling off the dogs. If and when he stumbles in a debate against uh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump will tear him limb from limb. I think we already know that. Donald Trump loves to get down in the dirt and, and, and attack you and fight in the mud. Joe Biden, I just don't think he's going to be capable. There was a time in his life when he was. This ain't it. And uh, after the debate, I think there's going to be an entirely different conversation about this if he's not wise enough. And I'm going to say this, if the Democrats aren't smart enough to back out of the debate, they'd be far better off to take the heat for not going to debate than they would to put this guy out there and have him, you know, do a mushroom cloud uh, in front of the entire world. Uh, talking of mushroom clouds, I'll tell you what is keeping me awake now at night. The intensification of the Trump administration's war of words and war of sanction and trade uh, measures escalating on the China front uh, to the uh, point of conflict. Yeah, you might, it is. You might yeah. think that alarmist. But this week, China was flying over Taiwan firing missiles and bombs over Taiwan into the sea because the United States had broken decades of policy by breaking the one China policy, by sending high level officials to meetings in Taiwan that were absolutely determined as a provocation uh, to China. And I'm beginning to worry uh, that China's running out of patience with all of this. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And Trump might regard a war with China, a limited war with China, he would hope, might be an election winner for him. Yeah, and, and you are, you know, you are wise in your concern here. And, and think about this, you know, for many years, um, a lot of developed nations have talked about Pakistan and said, if the Pakistani government were eventually to fall, there are a lot of, you know, very nefarious groups behind, uh, you know, in the shadows that a lot of, you know, responsible countries would have to go in and secure their nukes, right? Well, that's kind of us right now. The United States government, one could argue, has fallen to some extremist, uh, you know, extremist neoconservative and, 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 and neoliberal uh, groups. And we got nukes. We are a very dangerous country right now, a country that is basically falling apart. We have a government that is pretending like everything's OK. They're walking around. Again, we're talking about upwards of 13% of the entire nation facing uh, homelessness. We're talking about hunger. People, people, you can go on TV here in America and you can see people who are going from uh, a, a food bank to food bank each day just to get something to eat. America's turning into a third world country, but a third world country with nukes. And it is, we are very, very dangerous uh, situation. And, and I'll add this. You know, it was projected that somewhere around 2030 that China's uh, economy would pass the U.S. as the number one uh, the number one economy in the world, right? But if you look at what's happening now, our response to the pandemic has pretty much wiped out our economy. You can change 2030 to I don't know. I'm thinking 2021 because theirs is seems to be getting healthier, and our economy is to say it's in the toilet would be uh, you know would be given it the benefit of, of of the doubt. You can't have a decent economy when you don't even have a government capable of, of, of putting on an election in what is ostensibly a, demo, a, 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 you know, a democratic republic. Colin Nixon, I'd, I'd say it was a pleasure. It is a pleasure to see you again, but it's also quite chilling if you get my drift. Thanks for joining us on the Thank mother you. of all talk shows. There's an American call right now on that subject. Let's take it, please. 
Chris. Let's go to Michael in Minneapolis. Go ahead, Michael. Hey, George. How are you doing today? Always a pleasure to hear you. Go ahead. All right. Well, I was calling in. I, I want a quick comment just briefly on what you said about the Green Party. And it's even worse than you think. Recently, the Democrats worked and got the Green Party stricken off the ballot in three states, including swing states, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So you won't even have the option of voting green in those states. Yeah. But what I'm calling about was to talk about uh, RB, uh, Ruth Bader, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg whom obviously, you know, you had said you are not familiar with, so I thought it was worth uh, bringing up. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a very polarizing but important figure. Um, she is essentially the, you know, she was the vanguard of uh, gender dis dim discrimination law um, in the United States. So she, she managed to make a lot, of, um, a lot of equality cases that previously had not applied to women. Um, were applied. So, you know, the uh, things like women were able now to uh, sign a mortgage without a man, have a bank account without a male co-signer, have a job without being discriminated against by gender. Um, Why is all that left to judges, Michael? You see here, uh, we, we don't even know the names of our judges. I could not name for you, well, but one, the Julian Assange's judge. I don't know the names of any judges in Britain. Is it a healthy sign? Uh, of your democracy, that these fundamentals that you have described can be attributed to a judge? Um, no, but George, I think, I think what it highlights is that the judiciary in the United States is a fully political entity. And the right wing of the United States has been, you know, there's been a full out war on women, you know, at least as long as I've been alive and, and far longer. So the reason why people are so scared is because the liberals were already in a 5-4 uh, minority on the Supreme Court. And now with RBG gone, and, and Justice Roberts is, is a very, he's very conservative, but in our right-wing America, he's the quote-unquote swing vote. And he usually goes along with prior precedent, um, although he is very right-wing whenever he has the opportunity to be. So the fear is that with RBG gone, you get another conservative justice in, and all of a sudden, they don't really, they don't need Roberts. Um, they don't need Roberts as much to, you know, to sort of change the laws and to, you know, and the, the right wing in the United States is always, always trying to take away reproductive rights from women. That's been a consistent fight ever since Roe v. Wade in the 70s. And they're, you know, the, like the states in, uh, in certain conservative states, they're always passing legislation to try to restrict abortion rights and restrict, restrict other health care rights for women. Um, but the reason why this is really interesting in election year is because in 2016, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia died 237 days before Election Day, and uh, Obama nominated uh, Merrick Garland to replace him, and the, the, the Republican Senate said, no, we're not going to have a hearing. And instead of pushing for it, instead of using his bully pulpit, which he was never willing to do, and really, you know, really forcing the Republicans to make this an issue, privately behind the scenes, Obama said, hey, this isn't so bad because it will help get the base out to vote. So he used, so they sort of used the Supreme Court seat as a way to hopefully uh, motivate Democratic voters. Of course, it had the opposite effect. And what it did was actually galvanize Trump's base. And here, and you know, and here we are. So now we're in a situation where that was 237 days before the election, uh, when um, when just, when Antonin Scalia died. Now we're only 46 days before the election, I think, when RBG died. And now the same Republicans who said, "Oh, it's got to be up to the American people. We can't have, an, you know, we can't do this during an election year," are saying, "Oh, we need to confirm someone immediately." Well, well uh, and this, uh, but this, Michael, oh, all that tells me, Michael, is that Donald Trump knows how to use the bully pulpit in a way that uh, Barack Obama was not ready to. Thanks for the call. Garland Nixon was listening to that. Uh, Garland, I ask in a way the same question to you as I did to Michael. Uh, I don't know how liberal uh, this woman was. From a personal point of view, I'm not sure what is progressive about abortion, uh, for example. Uh, I know that people are going to have it, not trying to stop people having it, but I'm not sure why it's progressive. Uh, how liberal am I supposed to regard this woman and 
Why is a judge that important in your system? If all these things, abortion, uh, gay rights, and so on, are so important, why, do, why doesn't the American government legislate for them? Why do they rely on a here today, gone tomorrow judge? Uh, you make a good point because, in, in w w you know, within the context of the American system, most of the things that the um, that the Supreme Court rules on, generally, the uh, our Congress, our legislative branch, can go back and tweak it, and they can fix it the way they want to. But unfortunately, they're not; they're generally unable to do this. But here's the thing about the the, the concept of uh, women's rights or LGBT rights. You know, I work on a lot of that stuff, and I mean, in in the in the um, you know, in the interest of, of of, 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 uh, of, of openness, I'm actually on the National Board of Directors for the American Civil Liberties Union. So we're always in you know, Supreme Court for one reason or another. And what I've found is the LGBTQ rights and things of that nature, those rulings, to be quite honest, haven't changed much, even with some of these uh, conservative judges. When it comes to the social issues, they haven't been really that much different um, in, in, a, in a way that would be markedly you know, far right. What, what I see in American um, in our Supreme Court is they are there for corporate law. They are there to make the decisions when it comes to corporation, when it comes to the things about, you know, uh, uh, women, reproductive rights, et cetera. The conservatives have actually recently been very angry at their picks because, you know, let's face it, they're all the neoliberals, neoconservatives, so-called left, so-called right. When it comes to the social justice issues and the issues of LGBTQ, et cetera, they're not that far different. They are there, though to deal with corporate issues and to transfer full power to the corporate oligarchs. And they are really good at that. Garland, thanks. And I really appreciate you sticking around to respond to that call from the United States. Now, another storm uh, that uh, brewed this week was the book burning and the threat of banning and worse to J.K. Rowling. Who'd have thunk it? I did a short for RT on it. Take a look. It's psycho. The lunatics have taken over the asylum. 60 years ago, the great Alfred Hitchcock made his seminal movie, Psycho. And the murderer in that movie, Norman Bates, didn't just dress up in women's clothes. He dressed up in the clothes of his dead mother. Nobody called them a transphobe. Nobody's burning DVDs of the offending article. But when J.K. Rowling was reported to have dressed her murderer in her latest novel in a wig and a woman's coat, well, all hell broke loose. The roof came down on top of her. 50,000 people on Twitter liked a video of someone having bought the book, setting fire to it. So now we're into book burning territory, book banning territory. Now we're in to full scale repression of intellectual work. I don't need to labor the point of where this can all lead. Who started the book burning fad? in the 20th century, although witch hunters of all kinds have burned books and other people's intellectual work for centuries. Think the witches of Salem, and you'll see that they don't necessarily stop at burning the books. R.I.P. J.K. Rowling was also trending. I've got to say, when you find yourself wishing death upon an author, a novelist, because of a character she's drawn in her fictional work, it's you who's deep into psychiatric territory, not her. Now, I've never read anything from J.K. Rowling, not even Harry Potter. Matter of fact, I don't really approve of Harry Potter, but I wouldn't seek to ban it. Still less would I burn it. Even less would I wish death upon its author. I will fight to the end to defend the rights of people freely to express themselves, especially when I don't agree with what it is they are expressing. 
That's supposed to be the hallmark of civilization, is it not? That's supposed to be the hallmark of democratic thinking. And yet the people who are burning J.K. Rowling's books probably regard themselves as right-on liberals, hip progressives. J.K. Rowling has never said or written anything transphobic, at least not that I have seen. Transphobic means that you fear, loathe transgender people. I myself have had real life experience with a transgender person. I used to shake his hand firmly when he was living as a man, kissing his cheeks tenderly when he was transitioning to a woman. And then with some relief, I will confess, shaking his hand firmly again when he transitioned back again. I'm ready to treat anybody how they want to be treated. But I will not sign in my blood that they are what they would like themselves to be, a woman or a moon landing astronaut. I'm ready to call you captain, commander, wing commander, but I'm not ready to let you go behind the controls of the spaceship, at least not until you've had some proper training. And I'm not ready to agree to someone who is defining themselves as a woman, I don't know, stopping over at my wife's baby doll pajama sleepover party. No, that's for real girls. I'm not ready to let them bath with my daughter or get changed in a changing room with my daughter. I'm not ready for them to muscle in on her sporting activities, beating her to a pulp in a boxing ring or by a mile in the athletics because that's where her freedoms are being denied and invaded. The freedom of women and girls to their own spaces, their own sports, their own private lives is every bit as valuable, important, inalienable than the right of someone to identify as something that they are not. That doesn't make me transphobic because I neither fear nor loathe transgender people or transvestite people or gay people or any people who act differently to me. Let a thousand flowers bloom. That is my credo. But don't ask me to describe a rose as a daffodil because I simply won't do it. Me, I stand with JK Rowling. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. Well, it's just as well Moats has got its own money man now, David Lowe, an old friend of mine. Haven't seen him for many years. Uh, but the man that masterminded the takeover of Celtic and its move from, well, the old world into the new. I think he's got a new book uh, out actually about that. We'll ask him about that. But it's just as well, uh, David Lowe, uh, I hope he will agree uh, to be our money man because I've now got breaking news from the BBC. HSBC moved Ponzi scheme millions despite warning. This is from Panorama. HSBC, that's one of the world's biggest banks, allowed fraudsters to transfer millions of dollars around the world even after it had learned of their scam. Leaked secret files show. Britain's biggest bank, biggest bank, moved the money through its US business to HSBC accounts in Hong Kong, aha, in 2013, 2014. Its role in the $80 million fraud is detailed in a leak of documents uh, that have been called the FinCEN files. David Lowe, welcome uh, to the show. It's been some, well, the best part of 20 years. Very uh, good to see you again. Uh, you, we, you came on to talk about cryptocurrency, and we will. But have you got yeah. a response to this leaked BBC material? Well, George, I just heard about it literally 10 minutes ago when I was speaking to uh, 
your researcher, so I don't have any details of what's come out vis-a-vis HSBC, but I think we all know money laundering uh, uh, and banks has been going on for as long as there has been money and there have been banks. So it's just very uh, infrequently that they get caught in such a large way. But it is as old as the hills, and I can't say I'm that surprised. But details I do not have. I cannot comment beyond that. Does cryptocurrency uh, deepen that potential problem or alleviate it? When you have value, when you have money, and when you have greed, uh, there is always uh, fraud. Again, that's as old as the hills. Uh, Traditionalists, bankers, governments, those that seek to uh, regulate us, will always plough the furrow that cryptocurrency is a is a means of anonymously and fraudulently transferring money. That's not the case. It's a convenient banner, a convenient headline to use, but it's certainly uh, not the case. Most transactions by a significant margin still go through the traditional banking system, and that's where all the fraud lies and where all the theft lies, quite frankly. Yes, uh, but, but, but on the face of it, I mean, neither of us knows the criminal mind, uh, but if I was a criminal, I'd want to have my money in cryptocurrency rather than in, uh, in the Bank of Scotland in Byers Road, wouldn't you? I suppose you could say that if you wanted to transfer a lot of money anonymously, uh, you would maybe look at cryptocurrency as a means of doing that. But cryptocurrencies are becoming more and more regulated and practitioners in the industry have to be verified by the traditional uh, setups, the traditional governments. It's no longer uh, the Wild West that it was a mere five years ago. You can't really get involved in this space uh, in a significant way without uh, the people you're dealing with knowing who you are, uh, where you live, where you stay, and you have to provide documentation. So as each year goes by, it is conforming more and more with what we, we're, we're familiar with in terms of regulation. Well, let's go back to first base. Um, I, a very good friend uh, of Max Kaiser, who might be called the cryptocurrency king. He was certainly one of the very first uh, uh, off the rank uh, on it. And he's spoken to me about it so many times. But I've got to tell you, David, uh, almost all of it went right over my head. Why don't you give us an idiot's guide to what cryptocurrency is? Well, cri- cryptocurrency is just a series of codes that operate on what everybody is familiar with, a thing called the blockchain, which is a, just a euphemistic term for a distributed ledger technology, whereby the assets, which is basically the pieces of code, are owned by the people that operate the, the ledger, uh, the distributed ledger, and they get paid or the, the phrase used is they, they mine and they get paid in Bitcoin, which is the first and the largest uh, cryptocurrency for performing that task. So a distributed ledger comes with a distributed cost, and that cost goes to the, the miners that maintain, in this instance, which I'm talking about, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, so, what, what, what do they mean by miner? I've always been puzzled by this phrase. I have... Uh, some experience of mining, Uh, but we're not talking about people uh, uh, down below uh, with a pickaxe uh, hacking away at a wall. What what do they mean by mining? They get paid in Bitcoin for performing a duty or a function that helps to maintain the integrity of the blockchain, the distributed ledger. It's a means of payment for performing a duty. Uh, if okay. you want you to dig, dig or drill or mine a, a deeper and deeper, you really have to speak to a, a, a technology professional, but it would go beyond the comprehension of more, most of the listeners, I, I, I would suggest. Yeah, there's a danger of that. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say I get paid tonight uh, in Bitcoin. What does that mean? Do, do I get a bit of a coin or do I get an email saying you're now the proud owner of X? Uh, as your payment for tonight's show? Uh, And if so, how do I spend it? Well, think of it just as like an online banking account. If you wanted to get paid in Bitcoin, you would have to have what's called a wallet. And the person that was paying you would send you 
a specified number of bitcoins, or it could be a fraction of a bitcoin. One bitcoin is worth approximately a uh, ten or uh, eleven thousand dollars at the moment. Well, it'll definitely so be a it, fraction, David. Definitely be a <laughs> fraction. Well, maybe a big fraction. <laughs> I don't know. If it was half a bitcoin, if it was five thousand dollars, for example, the person that was paying you would send you half a bitcoin from their wallet to your wallet, and you would look at your wallet in the same way as you would look at a, a an online banking account, and you would see a credit of half a bitcoin to your account. And a Bitcoin is just like another currency, like a pound, a dollar, a euro. You could uh, transform that into dollars to for, for value or sterling or euros. It, just, it's a, it goes from one wallet to another is the answer to your question. Uh, and you see it as a balance in your wallet. But I couldn't and, uh, spend it. happens it, instantaneously. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't spend it in, well, I could spend it, I think, in your uh, place in Glasgow because you take Bitcoins. But I don't know any other shops or restaurants that would take my Bitcoin? Well, there's over uh, 5,000 cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin uh, is what you would call the first. Bitcoin is what you would call the largest in terms of uh, market value. The last time I looked, it had a market value of about $200 billion, and that represented two-thirds of the total market capitalization of all the uh, cryptocurrencies put together. But what is happening with Bitcoin? Bitcoin is emerging more, uh, George, as a store of value, much the same as gold is an alternative uh, investment, an alternative store of value in these troubled times. Uh, more and more people are becoming more and more worried about, as you know, the world we live in, the people that are running the world we live in, the veracity and, uh, and uh, integrity of the existing banking and saving systems and stock markets. So for more and more people, uh, Bitcoin represents what you would call an alternative investment. And that basically means they're buying Bitcoin because they think it's going to go up in value. It's a store of value. So that, that's really the primary role that uh, Bitcoin is playing uh, as, as it evolves. Now tell us uh, about your, uh, your, your uh, Mac Bitcoin. Match Bitcoin, that would be the Scott coin. So, I mean, you'll probably like this. I mean, I, I, I'm an investment guy, as you know, private equity investor. I was sitting watching a Alistair Darning debate with Alex Salmon in 2014 uh, over the currency for Scotland, should it be independent, and whether uh, Alex had a, a plan B. And, of course, I don't know if you remember that debate. I do, yeah, but, of course. Never forget uh, it. Well, I'll use my own language. I thought, uh, and I'm not being political in saying that, I thought Darling sliced and diced Alex Salmond uh, because he didn't have a plan B. And the most, uh, the most important thing that an independent country must have uh, and uh, wishes to pay its way is a, a currency. And I thought, uh, well, if Scotland uh, doesn't have its own currency, I, I think this whole independence thing is pretty much a waste of time. And in saying that, I have to keep emphasizing I'm being apolitical, I'm at, uh, and, and I'm also being very logical. So I thought, well, uh, they're going to lose the referendum. Currency is not a devolved power, so what can you have? You can have a cryptocurrency, a Scottish cryptocurrency. So I looked about and I found that uh, one already existed. The guy that uh, founded it, a guy called Derek Nisbet, was a one-man band of a fashion, and, and he wanted to sell it. So I, I bought the IP myself and a business partner. Uh, and paid for it in Bitcoin, I might add, uh, at a fraction of the price that it's at just now. And then we wondered what we were going to do with it. And we've had it ever since. But it caught the upswing in value. Bitcoin uh, went pretty ballistic, uh, and all the other cryptocurrencies did as well over the next few years. And Scotcoin actually emerged as a global top 100 uh, cryptocurrency, which is wow. maintained because it's worth $140 million. And out of the 5,000 cryptos that I've already referred to, it's in the top 100. So it ain't, it's no little sideshow, George. It's quite a big deal. So how, does it, how so, much does it cost me to buy one of your Scott coins? Well, roughly, if you want to express it in sterling time uh, terms, because we're, we're, we're in, we're in uh, the UK, one Scott coin is worth uh, approximately 12 pence at the, at the moment. And when you extrapolate that, that's out to the coins in issue. That's where the $140 million value comes. But one Scott coin is worth approximately uh, 12 pence. Well, uh, consider one sold, uh, David, if you'll sell me one. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, I mean, are you... 
projecting this into the uh, independence debate? Uh, and if so, so, is it falling on stony ground? Well, we have had uh, some discussions with uh, civil servants representing the Scottish government. But I, I, as you know, governments around the world just now are preoccupied with uh, immediate priorities and uh, accept and recognise that uh, something is uh, far out for uh, as cryptocurrencies is a bit too much for uh, the Scottish government to deal with just now. But certainly I think Scotcoin has a role to play in, in either a devolved or an independent Scotland. Cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They are, they're only going one way and that, that's upwards as more and more people understand how they work. You've got to remember, George, younger people are more tech savvy than people of our age. <laughs> yes, well, that wouldn't be hard in, in my case. Now, you'll always be Mr. Celtic to me. Did I uh, understand correctly that you've got a book about the takeover? No, I did bring out a book at the time, but what's happening is on its fifth day of reprint just now because a sort of younger generation are, are, are yeah. looking back 25 years and, and increasingly asking, you know, who, who was this guy McCann? What was all this about? You know, uh, I can hardly believe it. It's more than 25 years ago. Well, I can't but believe it. it. It's You've on, just it's on a me out. Sorry? I, can, I can't believe it. I, I had no idea it was 25 years. Amazing. Yeah, yeah more than that, in fact. But... Uh, so it's getting reprinted, and, uh, and there's interest in turning it into a movie. I have no idea who will play me. <laughs> <laughs> be a great movie. What, what's the book called, David? Well, the book's called The McCann Takeover, uh, but it was originally called uh, Rebels in Paradise. And you can, you can buy it on uh, Amazon or directly from the publisher, which is me. <laughs> Fantastic. David Lowe, the new Moats Money Man. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. I better go to the news. I'm two minutes late. It's the eight o'clock news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. COVID restrictions in England will get tougher if rules are not followed, Britain's Health Secretary has warned, as the government introduces £10,000 fines for people who fail to self-isolate. Matt Hancock said the country was facing a tipping point. If everyone follows the rules, then we can avoid a further national lockdown, he said. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson is understood to be considering a ban on households mixing and reducing opening hours for pubs. Asked if England could face another national lockdown, Hancock said, I don't rule it out, I don't want to see it. The move, under consideration by Johnson, could take the form of a two-week mini-lockdown in England, being referred to as a circuit breaker in an aim to stem a recent surge in cases. On Saturday, a further 4,422 new COVID-19 cases and 27 deaths were reported in the UK. Visitors have flocked to Blackpool despite police warning against having a last blast in the resort before tighter restrictions come into force. People reported queues for attractions, heavy traffic and little social distancing and few people wearing masks indoors. Lancashire will be subject to tighter restrictions from Tuesday after significant increases in COVID-19 cases but Blackpool is exempt. Police had said they were preparing for large crowds over the weekend. Singapore is distributing thousands of devices that can track where a person has been and who they've interacted with. The small Bluetooth device is meant for those who do not own smartphones and cannot use a contact tracing app that was previously rolled out by the Singapore government. While there are some concerns over data protection, authorities say the token helps vulnerable groups feel safer when out and about. Australia looks set to record its lowest daily coronavirus increase for three months with just 18 new cases reported so far. The state of Victoria, the epicentre of the country's COVID-19 outbreak, recorded 14 new infections to Sunday morning, down from 21 the day before. New South Wales and Queensland reported two cases each. The remaining states are yet to report their figures, but rarely record any new cases. Figures were last this low on June 23rd. Victoria's Premier Daniel Andrews said the numbers were cause for great optimism. 
his state, which has accounted for 75% of Australia's 26,900 cases and 90% of its 849 deaths, has been under lockdown since early July. Melbourne, the state capital, has been under tighter restrictions than any other areas, including a curfew and stay-at-home orders. Anti-lockdown protests in the city have become a regular sight. Earlier today, demonstrators gathered in the central business district. Saturday's protests in the park saw protesters being dispersed by police on horseback. Just one in ten of the world's population is likely to be protected against COVID-19 in the first year of vaccine being made available, according to scientists. Analysts of global manufacturing capacity shows just two billion doses could be made in 2021, even if a vaccine was given the green light by safety regulators at the start of the year. But with seven of the nine prototype vaccines in late stage clinical trials requiring two doses, that's likely to be enough to immunize only a little over 12% of the 7.8 billion people who need Need it. U.S. President Donald Trump has said he will this week nominate a woman to replace the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, escalating a political row over her successor. Ginsburg, who was 87, died on Friday just under two months before the U.S. elections. Trump's Democratic rival Joe Biden insists the decision on her replacement should wait until after the vote. The ideological balance of the nine-member court is crucial to its rulings on the most important issues in U.S. law. Trump has vowed to swear in Ginsburg's successor without delay, a move that's infuriated Democrats who fear Republicans will vote to lock in a decades-long conservative majority on the country's highest court. Ginsburg had also made her feelings clear in the days before her death. My fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed, she wrote in a statement to her granddaughter. A package containing rice and poison that was addressed to President Donald Trump has been intercepted before it reached the White House. The letter was discovered at a screening facility for White House mail earlier this week, officials said. They said a substance found inside the envelope was identified as ricin, a poison found naturally in castor beans. The Trump administration is yet to comment on the reports. Airstrikes on a Taliban base in northeastern Afghanistan have killed at least a dozen civilians. The twin Afghan strikes in Kunduz come as the country's government and the Taliban hold talks to reach a peace settlement. Provincial officials and a Taliban spokesperson said at least 12 civilians were killed and more than 10 injured. A defense ministry spokesperson claimed that more than 40 Taliban fighters were also killed in the strikes. The Taliban, however, did not confirm whether there were any casualties amongst its fighters. And finally, a football match was disrupted by an unusual pitch invader when an alpaca bounded onto the field. Carlton Athletic's tie against Ilkley Town in West Yorkshire on Saturday was halted for 15 minutes when Oscar the alpaca escaped from a nearby farm and joined the action. Attempts were made to entice it off the pitch with food before a farm managed to shepherd it home. Carlton is renowned in the league for having alpacas nearby. Ilkley manager Simon Armstrong said after 35 minutes it escaped, came through the entrance and proceeded to get on the pitch. The referee stopped the game. Carlton Athletics said farm animals had been kept near the pitch for several years, but it was the first time one had managed to stop a match. Club chairman John Flynn said, I don't know how he got out, there must be a little gap in the barrier somewhere, as we've seen some chickens here as well. Oscar the alpaca is reportedly very inquisitive and appeared to be enjoying himself, running up and down down the pitch. A couple of players even said he should be the man of the match. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Now, just to underscore David Lowe's point about this cryptocurrency thing being a young person's game, young Jamie Lowe, who reads the news so brilliantly, but who looks to me about 16, is himself a Bitcoin cryptocurrency king. He certainly makes more out of cryptocurrencies than he does for reading the news for me, let me assure you. Now on my poll, what was the, uh, why was the death of an American judge a leading item on BBC? A, she was a liberal, 21%. B, to damage Trump, 40%. C, because we have become the 51st state of the union. That's at 39%. So either to damage Trump, or because we are the 51st day, or maybe, actually, all three. Anyway, you can vote until 10 minutes to nine 
on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. Now, uh, it was another week of persecution, veering between uh, tragedy and farce and back again to tragedy in the Old Bailey this week in the persecution of Julian Assange. Pablo Navarrete has made a cracking film uh, about this, and he joins me now. Pablo, thank you uh, for joining us. We'll talk about your documentary in a minute, uh, but how did the week go for Julian? From my standpoint, his defense team is winning every argument out of the park. Question is, does that matter? Um, unfortunately, it uh, probably might not matter, and that, and that speaks to the absolute travesty uh, of the British judicial system, and specifically in relation to the process around Julian Assange. I mean, uh, there has been a litany of articles now showing uh, the irregularities in how this case has been processed from the very beginning, uh, even with, you know, with uh, Keir Starmer, when he was head of CPS, intervening with the Swedish uh, prosecutors who wanted to speak to Julian initially over these sexual assault allegations, to the judges presiding over the case, their links to conservative, oh, in many, in, in some instances, their merit to former conservative defense ministers, links to the security services. But yes, I think this, I've heard the same. I've heard that the, uh, the defense has been winning, hands down. Uh, and that this really uh, should really mean in any fair uh, system of justice that the judge would not allow the, the U.S. Uh, extradition request uh, and allow Julian Assange to go to the U.S. where he faces 175 years in prison, further prison for exposing U.S. war crimes. However, this judge has a 95 percent uh, I think, a rate of extraditing people. And as I said, the British justice system has covered itself in, in uh, you know, ingloriously uh, with this case. So let's wait and see. But it's been a good week. I, I, I'd, I'd be uh, amazed. Uh, she might be fooling us all, but she has favoured the Americans at every turn, on every point, uh, from the regime that Julian is uh, enduring uh, to the conduct of the case in court, uh, the potential uh, offences uh, of, uh, of uh, distortion of the process, abuse of process are, are legion now, and uh, they may all have to be explored in, uh, in an appeal, uh, which, of course, if she finds in favour of the US, there will be, and maybe a, a better judge, maybe a judge that cares more about justice will be found on the appeal uh, court. Uh, but she could be, I suppose, the greatest actress since Garbo, uh, and uh, giving us all these uh, um, dashed hopes uh, only in order to turn the tables. That's a possibility. Uh, the defense team produced some pretty spectacular witnesses in the week, including the legendary 89-year-old Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the man who leaked the Pentagon Papers, uh, which changed the course of American history, political and legal history, who's still alive and who was on, at, I think, 2 o'clock in the morning his time or 3 o'clock in the morning at his time uh, by video link to the court, and he was unequivocal, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it's not just Daniel Ellsberg, but he joins, I mean, a legend such as Daniel Ellsberg has joined what now is an increasing chorus uh, of, of, of real journalists, I'd say, because there are the, those that call themselves journalists who have uh, really joined in the persecution, who have been kind of almost the, the, the vanguard of the smearing of Julian Assange, of the... Uh, people, journalists, uh, a notable am amount of them at the Guardian newspaper who have been, you know, initially sort of benefiting from all of this uh, courageous journalism that Julian Assange uh, has exposed and done, but now we're, we're very much at the at the vanguard of, of smearing him, of setting the ground for public opinion to not really care sufficiently that a, a journalist is being a, is a political prisoner in the UK. But we have 
real journalists like John Pilger, real journalists like Daniel Ellsberg, even real journalists like Mohamed El Mazi, who appears in my film, someone who's just been reporting the truth around this case uh, very meticulously uh, from the very beginning. And I think anyone who reports honestly about the case um, will will report that this is a, a massive political persecution of a journalist for exposing war crimes. And what the US has been is trying to do is to send a very chilling message to anyone, almost like a mafia, almost like a mafia leaving a, the, the dead, the the head of a dead horse in someone's bed, sort of saying, you know, you mess with us and we will destroy you. And so um, I think that true journalists uh, know what's at stake. Tr real uh, groups of freedom of expression know, know what is at stake. And I think in as far as the truth can come out, I think public opinion can maybe help turn mm -hmm. this and put political pressure uh, on, on the British to, to, to not acquiesce in, in becoming the 51st state of the U.S., as you mentioned, if, the, if we're not that already. Uh, yeah, um, and of course, Peter Hitchens, uh, a right-wing conservative journalist, very powerfully coming out for Julian Assange this week. And the wonderful court reporting from the Honourable Craig Murray, former mm -hmm. British ambassador. One does sense a certain change. The issue is whether or not it's too late. Now, tell us about your film, Pablo, and how people can see it. So my film is a 35-minute short documentary that, that follows Julian's father, John Shipton, who's been traveling to and from Australia here to visit Julian to help uh, to be part of this global grassroots campaign to, to, to prevent Julian from, from, from essentially being killed in a US uh, prison. Uh, he's already suffered, as we know, um, as a, a de facto prisoner in the Ecuadorian embassy, given that the UK did not allow him a safe passage to Ecuador after he was given political asylum. And this film uh, just follows Julian's father, a, a number of solidarity events in the UK, but also uh, it tries to humanize uh, the story of a father essentially trying to save his son's life. Uh, but it also tries to offer this other side, which is to show this group of sort of very dedicated, small, but very dedicated grassroots activists who have come rain or shine, been outside Belmarsh Prison, outside the Ecuadorian Embassy, outside the Westminster Magistrates Court, who have been shunned, ignored by the media, denigrated or laughed at, um, and who know what's at stake. They know that this is the, one of the greatest injustices of our time. So the film just tries to show both of those sides of a story in a 35-minute film, and um, you can see it. It will be actually on Vimeo On Demand as of early this week. We've done a number of online screenings. Uh, we've done a screening in Spanish uh, and French in Brussels on Monday. Uh, there will be other screenings in different languages, but it will be available to stream on de uh, on demand uh, this week. And it's called what, Pablo? It's called No Extradition, um, uh, which is which is a simple uh, title, and it's the title that was on the placards that I would see at Belmarsh at uh, the Magistrates Court, and it's. Uh, it basically encapsulates really what, what, what the call is, what the demand is, and what really should happen if there was any justice with Julian Assange. I hope everyone watches it. Pablo Navarrete, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, on Facebook, Tom says, Sleepy Joe will not turn up for his debates with Trump. They'll make an excuse for him. And Michaela says, Trump has nothing to worry about. He has walked this. And Gareth says, I never knew Garland Nixon. He's great. Thanks for having him on. Great indeed he is. And on Twitter, Roger says, you can't pay tax on cryptocurrency. It's specifically for tax, tax dodging payments anyway. You can't buy bonds with it. It's a game running alongside a real economy. Nothing more than an elaborate PayPal. Jason, though, uh, says only in a few places is Bitcoin legal tender for tax. I've been involved for several years. It's here to stay, says Jason, and it will soon replace gold as the chosen secure long-term investment. That's why I'm buying 12 pence worth of Scott coin instead of buying gold. I'll be back in 60 seconds with That Was The Week. Express Woking. What is it you want? 
Oh, you want an ill-advised interview on the BBC? A cheese pizza, extra immature, and a raw bailout. No, we don't take taxpayers' money. Yeah, but we do take contactless. Would you like a receipt for that, Mr Prince? The giant Labour Party sailing clearance is now on. Hurry now, as we've got zero interest in our party. It's literally the lowest it's ever been. Give up on the common man and save today. That's right, we're getting rid of all of the Corbynites. Literally every single one. Being a Blairite has never been more in style. Only available at what should be the UK's biggest political party. The new, new Labour Party. We're doing this again. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, this is the spot where I look at the seven days, these seven days in history, which have changed the world, or perhaps just heavily influenced it. This is the week. And to be honest, it's not been a particularly auspicious or earth-shattering one. But on this day in 1970, the Russian space probe Luna 16 landed on the moon to collect samples from its surface. We're going to look at the whole issue of UFOs and so on uh, in our uh, Moats Extra uh, when it starts in, uh, in October. And we'll uh, talk to this man, Richard Gage, on the uh, 9-11 issue also. Uh, it was the first time, Luna 16, was the first time an unmanned probe has been used to bring objects back to Earth from space. In 1973, this week, tennis champion Billie Jean King, remember her? Beat Bobby Riggs in what was called the Battle of the Sexes after Riggs challenged her to the duel. I remember that very well, and it was <clears throat> rather long ago. Uh, a day later, on the 21st uh, of this month, in 1922, President Warren G. Harding signed a joint resolution of approval to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And in 1936, the Spanish fascist junta named Francisco Franco to be Generalissimo and Supreme Commander. And in 1949, Chinese Communist leaders proclaimed the People's Republic of China. That's pretty important, for goodness sake. This was the week in 1998 that President Bill Clinton's testimony about his relationship with a young female assistant was released to the United States public. The video of the American president's embarrassing interview in front of the grand jury was broadcast on US networks. During the examination, Clinton was questioned by prosecutors about the exact nature of his affair with Monica Lewinsky and whether he had previously lied under oath. His defense against the accusations relied on elaborate definitions of certain words. And I'm quoting, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. If is means is and never has been, that's one thing. If it means there is none, that was a completely true statement, he said. Confused? They were. Yes, there are known knowns and unknown knowns and downright obfuscation. I did not have sex. Sexual relations, wasn't it? I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Did I tell you my Monica Lewinsky story? Uh, in the run-up to the Iraq war, I was forever saying on television and public platforms, I'm in favor of a special relationship with the United States of America. I just don't want the kind of special relationship that Miss Lewinsky had with President Clinton, with the junior partner always on their knees, etc., etc. It was a zinger. I mean, it really traveled. People would laugh. People would applaud wildly, but one day Tony Blair asked me to stop using it. 
And as I was a Labour MP at the time, and he was the leader of the party, and because I'm that kind of guy, I gave him an assurance that I would stop using it, because he argued it was really demeaning and degrading to the party and the government and therefore the country. So I stopped using it. I didn't use it for months. And then one day at the London School of Economics, where my grandson, who is working next door, uh, is going to be studying quite soon. No, he's at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, very nearby. Anyway, I was at the London School of Economics. And it was a huge meeting against the oncoming war in Iraq. It was packed to the gunnels, hundreds and hundreds of people there. And for some reason, I used that line again. I just don't want a special relationship like the one that Miss Lewinsky had with President Clinton. And I was vaguely aware of a kerfuffle and someone marching out and slamming the door and the next questioner said, that was rather mean, Mr. Galloway, because not only is Miss Lewinsky a student at this school, but she was present in the second front row uh, when you just said that, and she's just stormed angrily out the door. So I'm sorry, Miss Lewinsky, if you're watching. Where was I? Uh, a few years before, on this day in 1986, Prince Charles heir to the British throne, admitted on TV that he talks to his plants. Still does, apparently. Doesn't everyone talk to their plants? On September 22nd in 1980, war broke out in what was to be a 10-year conflict between Iraq and Iran, when Iraq bombed several Iranian air and military supply bases, including Tehran's International Airport. Britain, of course, was on the side of Saddam Hussein. In 1952, on September 23rd, the world-famous film actor and director Charlie Chaplin returned to England for the first time in 21 years. He arrived with his wife Una, daughter of playwright Eugene O'Neill, and their four children at Southampton on the Queen Elizabeth cruise liner, having been barred from returning to the US because of his political views. They eventually settled in Switzerland and went on to have four more children. God bless them all. Imagine, America banned Charlie Chaplin. I read his autobiography as a very young man. I must have been still at school. It was a very profoundly impressive uh, book, I must say. Also, on the 23rd of this month, in 1957, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered U.S. troops to support the integration of nine black students at Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas, later famous for the obfuscator Bill Clinton. This was the week in 1976 when the rogue Rhodesian government, as was, agreed to introduce black majority rule to the country within two years, uh, but only after the black majority in the country had to wade through oceans of their own and other people's blood in order to force them to do so. A year later on, uh, a year later on 15,000 people attended Steve Biko's funeral in South Africa. He had been murdered by prison officers. And on the 25th of this month, in 1983, 38 prisoners escaped from the Maze High Security Jail in the north of Ireland. And I actually know the man that organized it. And finally, on the 26th, it was the day in 1580 that Francis Drake completed the circumnavigation of the world, sailing into Plymouth aboard the Golden Hind. Although there are still people watching this show who believe he should have fallen over the edge because, of course, the earth is flat. In 1969, the Beatles released the Abbey Road album in this week. And in 1984, Britain and China finalized an agreement to end more than 150 years of UK occupation in Hong Kong. And we're seeing the ramifications of that to this day. Well, Perhaps it was a 
bit more of a significant seven days than the people through the glass imagined uh, that it would be. Now we'll take calls. Uh, next, 02077 982 255 is the number in the UK. And in the US, it's 001 757 744 4480. We've even got a caller on the line. It's John in Glasgow on the virus. Go ahead, John. Hi, George. How are you doing, sir? Good. Very nice to hear from you. Yep, yep. I'm just on the phone with regards to the... I actually work for the Glasgow City Council. OK. OK, and I'm basically concerned just now, you know, because uh, we're dealing with a lot of, uh, like, kind of a, a temporary accommodation and I've taken no interest in the safety of the employees who are going into different, uh, different areas and different houses, you know. And what, so, uh, uh, you mean there's not enough PPE, for example? Sorry? You mean there's not enough personal protective equipment? Yeah, for yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I, exactly, George, exactly. There's actually none, you know, nothing. And and what, what's the union support. saying about that, John? Well, I think, I think it's actually terrible, to be honest. You know, <coughs> pardon me, sorry. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's Eves in Idaho. Up next. Go ahead, Eves. Hello, George. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted uh, to, to tell you uh, um, one thing about uh, Julian Assange, why I feel a little bit uh, optimistic. Mm. And also I would like um, to, to ask you a question about it. But uh, my comment is that if I, understood, if I understand it correctly, the prosecution tries to prove that Julian Assange uh, endangers the life of uh, some spy and things like that. And the defense uh, tries to prove that it's political. Now, um, a, few, uh, a few days ago, I think, I heard that the prosecution, the American side, the, the Justice Department, acknowledge that uh, Assange was given a, a proposal, you know, to give up his source uh, in, in exchange for a pardon. And uh, that, for me, is, uh, is devastating for the prosecution, because how can you say that it's about saving the life of your spy and things like that, and at the same time try to get some source? So I think that, that is not going, it's not going very well. No, they, the they also, uh, the Justice Department, your Justice Department, uh, was also forced to acknowledge uh, that they have no evidence of any person coming to any harm as a result of uh, WikiLeaks's uh, dumps because WikiLeaks took uh, quite extraordinary care uh, to retract names and identifying uh, characteristics. Yes, no, no, that, that's true. So I think, I think basically uh, they don't have a very good case, and I feel like uh, England at the end would not extradite him. I'd but be surprised the if have... the appeal court extradited him, I must say. I'm, I'm almost certain that this level uh, of court that he's in now uh, will, uh, will extradite him, but I, I cannot believe that the uh, British judiciary, which is um, the last institution in the country uh, that I would say uh, has not been entirely corrupted uh, would uh, agree to that extradition in these circumstances. But we'll see. Go ahead, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so my question is, uh, um, America doesn't recognize the International Court of Justice, but my question is, England, they do, uh, uh, they do follow the International Court of Justice recommendation. Why? The International Court of Justice doesn't uh, tell England, doesn't take the case, basically. Well, why, why uh, well uh, because uh, these cases that he's being tried on uh, cannot be tried at the International Criminal Court. The United States refused to join uh, the ICC. Uh, in fact, despite refusing to join it, it is currently literally threatening to invade The Hague in the Netherlands. I'm not making this up. They have a proposed bill, the Invasion of the Netherlands bill, in front of Congress, uh, which they hope to give them power 
to invade the court in The Hague if the court ever had the temerity to prosecute any American citizen. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And only a country, it, of it, course, it, can refer a matter uh, to the ICC, not an individual uh, or any other entity, only a state. I see. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Is that, is that yeah. your question? Eve, thanks, as always, for the call. Brian is in Motherwell on the virus. Let's hear if we get more sense out of Brian than we did out of the last joker, but one. Brian, go ahead. Hello, Mr. Galloway. Hope you're well. Very well. Thank you very much. Um, well, what it was, was I was reading the newspaper um, during the week, and I, I discovered an article about um, Van Morrison, Neil, Noel Gallagher, and Ian Brown from the Stone Roses, right? Three men that grew up, uh, I grew up with them as my musical heroes. And they're still, still my heroes. I, I don't disown them in any way. But I was very, um, you know, if I ever want to chill out to some music or listen to Astro Weeks, you know, Van Morrison was one of the greatest white soul singers of all time. I don't de deny the man I agree. of that. I've but, spent a lot of money watching Van Morrison. You're quite right. <clears throat> and, um, but I'm, I'm very angered um, at their comments this week. Um, don't, None of these three men have set foot in a university. They've got no medical background. So don't act as if they know more than the scientists do mm -hmm. um, when it comes they to... They also don't mass. have to get on the bus, Brian. Yeah, they don't exactly. have to. They don't have to work in Tesco. Uh, exactly. They, they, they don't have to work in the carpet factory. Uh, they are uh, living lives of ivory tower luxury. So... Uh, Coronavirus not quite as fearsome for them as it is for your bus driver. It certainly is not. And I, I might be wrong about this, and anybody's welcome to correct me on this, but my understanding is Japan never even shut down their economy. But what they did do was they ensured that all their, pub, their public wore face masks. And according to what I've read, they've had one twelfth of the deaths that the UK had and they didn't even um, shut down their economy. So, I mean, think, think about that for a minute. And, 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 all that <clears throat> and not all that coincides with the scientific consensus that face coverings reduce your risks of catching coronavirus by 80%. I, that's just what I've heard. It's not a 100% effect. Of, but no, of it, course, it but uh, uh, if, if you think about it, if you, if, if you put it this way, if every single person in the country wore a mask... Uh, then the transmission from person to person uh, through spit coming out of the mouth would obviously be heavily reduced. That is, I mean, an idiot can see that. And Japan is a living and breathing example of that. And no, no Gallica is somebody that has surprised me in recent years. Um, like a working class guy growing up in a working class area of Manchester. I, I used to think his brother was the arrogant one, but I'm starting to have a rethink on that. Well, you, know, it, you know what his brother said? I can't swear on, the, on RT, but uh, his brother <laughs> had some choice uh, words to describe him. Let's just say that his brother, that we both thought was the arrogant one, has got a lot more sense than Noel Gallagher. Thanks very much, Brian, uh, for that call. Uh, what happened to John? has become a thing, has become a question. Uh, Renv says John on the phone while being exorcised by the priest. Was that what it was? I'm glad it was only exorcised by the priest. And Paul says his missus hit him on the head with a saucepan. Ali says what happened to the yelling guy? Assange got him. Ray says John got, <laughs> John got COVID live on the phone. And Alex says John just got his phone bill. That is very, very funny. Thank you very much indeed. Kristen says, how will this damage Trump? What is the worth? Britain already dislike him. Uh, this is the, uh, the poll question. I'll come to that in a minute. And on Facebook, Mark says, can we expect the bankers in the city of London, alleged in the recent report to have laundered money for criminals around the world to be held in Belmarsh and extradited to the United States to stand trial and face up to 20 years. Didn't think so, says Mark. Ditto, says George. Uh, now, 
Let me give you the poll numbers because you've only got 10 minutes to vote. Why was the death of an American judge a leading item on BBC News? A, she was a liberal, 21%. B, to damage Trump, 41%. And C, because we have become the 51st state of the union. That's at 38%. So 10 minutes to go on my Twitter feed. Let me take a quick break. Call me. Come and have a go. If you think you're hard enough, don't bring up a false name. Come on air. Call me. And let's have this matter out. Mm, let's get ready to rumble! How have you I got know, the nerve to tell people to Brexit if, you have not, if you're not that, telling them the repercussions? That's 2016's argument, Michael. I'm no longer arguing with you about the merits of Brexit. I'm arguing with you about democracy, about the right of the majority to have their decision, their vote implemented. This match will get red hot. Not have a referendum. No, Let them have I, a referendum. Let them sort it out amongst themselves. Because I want a referendum. Robert, I want <laughs> a referendum. Let me put that in capital letters. If you think this year of 2020, which is shaping up already to be an anus miserableus for the SNP, if you think this is your year, go ahead. Come on. Let's have it out. It's on. But no, no, George, it's not as simple as that, right? Have you seen the documentary about Cambridge Analytica and the people no. who work there? Have you looked at the I know global nothing about impact? them. I'm, I'm not interested but, but in them. Precisely, but I'm not interested. I'm, I'm not interested in them, Bruce, because it's all a red herring. Just like Russia Gate was a but, red but, herring. But you're up. Do you only want to hear voices that agree with you? Because if you do. You're not clever enough to be at this open university of the airwaves. In fact, you need to go back to remedial and learn something about what democracy and freedom of speech actually mean. George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Join us at the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees. Now, Duke says on YouTube, I got an email from a Nigerian prince. If I send a hundred quid, I will, get, <laughs> I will get a million Bitcoin. That is such a coincidence, Duke, because that Nigerian prince is forever also writing to me. And Sam says on YouTube, what Garland said is true. Americans can't even make ends meet going from one food pantry to the next way before COVID hit. I volunteered in one for a year. I couldn't take the heartbreak and the sad situation I witnessed. A large number of people are concerned about what happened to our earlier caller. So if he would put people out of their misery and tell us uh, whether he was struck down, struck dumb, or just dumb, I'd appreciate it. And uh, John says most American young people don't even know who Adolf Hitler was or when the Second World War took place. How sad is that? Brian is in Glasgow. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, George. A lot of hey, callers George from is... Scotland tonight. Well, I hope you're not showing any bias there, George. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be accused <laughs> of it, I'm sure. Depends <laughs> I'm sure if you're you a will. Celtic man or not. Uh, I'm a Celtic man, but I lived in Larkhall for many years, and I'm not really, as far as a Celtic or Rangers fan, Good. considered a true fan, Good. because... I will support Rangers, and as you know, true Celtic Rangers fans never seem to support no, the other team. No, no, that's true. But that's, that's you we'll not, across all we'll, the We'll not bother explaining that to the rest of the world, Brian. It's a, yeah, it's a yeah, Scottish yeah, thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, I was wanting to talk, George, about two cases, and I know I listened the other day to your uh, People's Party uh, dissertation, uh, the Julian Assange case. Yeah. And this and a comparative analysis to that American justice system and how it treated uh, Mr. Epstein. Yeah. Now, Epstein, people talk about the charge you got. I say that charge is a criminal act. 
as far as the legal system of America is concerned. How can a man be charged with soliciting prostitution from a child? In other words, he attempted the rape of a child, yeah. first of all. Yeah. Then he got an 18-month sentence where he was out every day. Yeah, he was, go- asking- he was going to work uh, in a, in a chauffeur-driven limousine every day. He only slept oh, he in was- the jail. He was doing more than that. I'm he sure was he was. More than that, I'm sure he was. I, yeah. I saw the now. Netflix uh, doc. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And George, I have to say, I'm amazed at the public as well here because on the same part, Julian Assange's continued incarceration is a criminal act. I sent an email to you uh, on air saying that there's a Pinochet versus UK court case. Now, I remember Pinochet well, yeah. Case, yeah, it was dismissed. Now, people seem to think it was dismissed because of his age. It was dismissed technically by the set-up by the British state, and I wonder if your uh, ex-ambassador friend, Mr Murray, would know this, but his case was dismissed because I used it in my own case, uh, in a civil case, where he could not be seen to get justice because one of the three judges overseeing his case had a relationship as a chief executive raising funds for one of the uh, signatories to his arrest, Human Rights Watch. He raised funds for them purely as a, as a philanthropic effort. But nonetheless, he appointed himself to this crucial case. Then the prosecution got an anonymous call to make them aware of this discovery. And it was on that basis his case was dismissed because he couldn't be seen to get a fair trial. Now we come to Julian Assange. Julian Assange is not a citizen of this country. He has indulged in journalism. Journalism, in the American sense, is built into the Constitution. And so you are watching the complete criminal capture, if it has always not always been that way, of America and Britain. Because I don't understand how the public haven't got it. We are being run by criminals, George. Well, uh, the public, uh, uh, thanks for that, Brian. The public haven't got it because the media has deliberately kept the truth from the public. Uh, Mike is in the Bahamas. I've always, I'm a sucker for the Bahamas. Go ahead, Mike. What's it like there? Is it nice? Oh, today's a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky. Uh, It's about uh, 28, 30 degrees. Is the Bahamas more than one place, or is it is it one island, or more than one? Oh, it's a, it's more than one. It's lots yeah. of islands. Yeah. Not much big population. Only about four hundred thousand people. Sounds idyllic. And anyway, I, what would you like to talk about? I live about? on New Providence Island, which is the biggest. Oh yeah. Uh, most populous island. And is that a but U.S. We, territory? Oh no, no. We used to be um, a, a British colony. British. Okay. Do you, do you remember? Um, Edward, the uh, the king who abdicated. Oh, he was sent there. That's right, because yeah, he, was he was a collaborator. Governor. He was a collaborator well, with Hitler. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So he um, he was sent there to be governor general or something. That's right. Now, I get all yeah, these uh, Barbados, Bahamas. I sometimes get them uh, mixed up. And uh, one of the West uh, Indian islands has just uh, decided to become a republic. To ask the Queen to leave, finally. I think yes, I think it's Barbados. They're going to make her not head of state. That's right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I but keep actually, interrupting. I'm not you. a Bahamian citizen. I'm a um, U.S. and U.K. dual national. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, last week I called about what the Republicans were doing to um, disenfranchise voters, and um, actually got some numbers. There's this uh, senior writer for Mother Jones, Ari Behrman. And he was on Democracy Now! And he's saying that what the Republicans are doing in Florida can affect up to 1.4 million voters, which wow. is uh, wow. pretty big. And then um, also some other things that they're doing. The GOP wants to require ballots to be received by Election Day instead of postmarked by Election Day. That's a big difference. Uh, so if, if you have slow mail... Unfortunately, we've and lost then, Mike. Course, I think I've certainly lost him. I don't know if you can still... Hear him. Uh, I can hear you, Chris, but I, I lost Mike. Is he still there? Yes, me? Mike. What happened? Uh, uh, I don't know. It was, just a, now? it was a slight interruption. You were saying to me, I think the rest of the world heard you, uh, that the Republicans want the ballot papers to be received by election day, not just postmarked prior to yes. election day. Go ahead. Yes, and then they're also um, trying to keep 
photo ID lures on the books, and a lot of minorities don't actually have photo IDs, so that also skews the electorate. Um, and even in, they're doing things like in Pennsylvania, they're um, trying to fight against uh, drop boxes being put in various places so people can just deliver their ballots. So they're doing everything they can just to keep the uh, electorate down because they know the Republicans will be favored by uh, lower turnout. That doesn't mean that electoral fraud isn't actually a real thing, though, Mike. Uh, I can testify to you uh, that well, I have every time come across it seems lots to be of it. It's the Republicans that are doing it. Yeah, you don't uh, think Democrats it, do election fraud? Well, I, I don't think it's a serious problem. I mean, I've, I've been an expat for 22 years, and I've been voting by mail for 22 mm. years. And I mean, my, my ballot has a barcode on it, so they know where it's from or who it's from, and it's a valid voter. Yeah, we don't have anything okay. like that uh, protection, I must say. But uh, I've fought, uh, fought against a certain party often enough in inner cities to know that... Uh, just because you're supposedly the left wing of the two parties doesn't mean you can mm -hmm. be trusted on postal balloting. Mike, thanks uh, for that. Malcolm is in Spain on the lockdown measures there. Uh, go ahead, Malcolm. George, nice to speak to you. The last time I spoke to you was a few weeks ago. And just update me very quickly. Uh, congratulations on the door for your, your birth of your daughter, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I missed the, the name. Oban. Oban. The, Sc Lovely. the Scottish Lovely. town of Oban. Yes, exactly. From that to the, well, yes, I, I, I agree with that. Now, George, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something to you now, and I want you to think about it before you assassinate me, okay? <laughs> <It's> okay. Like, <laughs> okay, and I'm going to use it in, like, I won't use Scottish football teams because we know that Rangers and Celtic are up there and Hearts and Hibs and Cowden and Beef are down there. But let me, let me put it in, in, in perspective, and I, I know you don't like China to be, to be slighted at, but... Here's one thing. It's a conspiracy theory, which I know you don't like, okay? So let's imagine that COVID-19 is Norwich City or, uh, or Cowden Beef, if you want to take it in football terms, and you've got a Real Madrid, a Liverpool, and a Manchester City out there. Now, if they released it on purpose, it was like against the trade deal with America, and they're saying, basically, if you have a go at us, because I don't think we can militarily, China can beat anybody else at fighting, but they can release a virus that can cripple the world, and they really don't give a monkeys about it. So I, I say to you, George, do you think that's a possibility that they release all are, are you phoning me from a hospital, Malcolm? Now, George, I, you, always, you always say to people uh, that you disagree with that well, you're no, a you mental... So, you sound mental to me. First Why? of all, first of all... The idea that China, that China can't fight anybody when it has the biggest army in the world and is bristling with thermonuclear weapons is just about the most mental statement you could possibly make. Secondly, George, se no, George, I, I'll let you back in. I want to critique what you said and explain why I think it's mental. Explain why I think you must be on a day out from Ward 5. If China which whose economy was on track to become the world's biggest economy, how could China possibly have an economic interest in the collapse of international trade when China is the biggest beneficiary of international trade because it manufactures more than anyone else? Malcolm. Well, on your first point, um, who's, who's faring very well at the moment? China. Who doesn't give a monkeys about their populace in Hong Kong protests and the Rohingya, you know, the, the, the Muslims that they... they the Rohingyas in. are in Burma, <laughs> Malcolm. Malcolm, okay, so the Rohingyas are in Burma, that's, not that's China. Bangladesh. Well, it was Bangladesh. They're in Burma. They are massacred in Burma and have fled to Bangladesh as refugees, those that managed to get out alive. Anyway, okay. my point is, okay. a little knowledge is dangerous. And that's what you've got, a little knowledge. Would you agree that the, the, the Chinese put the Muslims in concentration camps, yes or no? Absolutely not. 
It's an absolute lie. Are you serious? Are you serious? It's you that's escaped from Ward 5 if you don't believe that China aren't locking up Muslims in, in, in concentration camps. You're on, you, you've escaped from Ward 5. Well, you what's your evidence, the Malcolm, what's your evidence for that? Um, have you not seen the pictures of them being shipped off no, there? No, they turned out to be pictures of completely different people in a completely different part of China. You really need to keep up, Malcolm. I asked you what your evidence was, and all you could say was, um, have you not seen the pictures? Well, that's the thing. Well, that's why I listen to you, George, because I respect your opinion on world events. Well, so well you're not listening listen closely listen. enough. You're, you're, first of all, you say, <laughs> first of all, you say, China can't fight anybody. It is the world's biggest army. It has yeah, George, thermonuclear weapons by the thousand. But yeah, it can't but fight point, anybody. Okay, George. So my point is that if you go to war on nuclear weapons, everybody's dead. China are brutal enough to release a virus for their own means. And well, I but think what that was, was I'm asking, but I, that's what I'm asking you. What did they gain? What could they possibly have gained from a virus devastating the capitalist economies that were buying Chinese goods by the, by the ocean load? How could China benefit from that? George, you need to wake up. I'll tell you how they benefit. Is Trump does not get re-elected. Biden gets in. He's a, he, he's a communist China-loving person. Now I know you're in that, Ward 5. That, now, that no, now I know that Malcolm in Spain is actually calling uh, from Ward 5 in Broadmoor. Joe Biden is a communist, according to Malcolm in Spain. Let's hear from Joshua in London. Go ahead, Joshua. You all right, George? Yeah. How's everything going? Good. Yeah, I was just going to... Um, I've been looking through... And I don't take Wikipedia at their gospel word. No, do don't. Do not misunderstand me. Don't. So do, do correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. Mm -hmm. but I've looked at the turnout for Scottish Parliament elections, okay? Like the turnout. About 55%, so, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the maximum they've ever got is about 58.6%, mm -hmm. okay? That is yeah. the highest they ever have had. Admittedly, they haven't had that many. Mm -hmm. The first one was only in, I think, 1999, and they've had about, what was it, four or five, six, yeah, maybe? Yeah, six, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I, I should have kept a better count. It ain't that many. But the, it, the turnout for the Scottish independence referendum was 84.7%. Yeah, uh, what well, record, trying to be yeah, a, yeah, absolute yeah. record. Yeah, so how, how can a, 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 min a traditionally minimum turnout, and it's likely to be that in the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, due, due largely to COVID, is probably not going to be very high because people are not going to be queuing at polling stations mm. like they would be traditionally, like, mm. without, you know, minus COVID. How is that a, a, a sort of a, a well, mandate that's right. to override uh, the uh, Well, it's not a mandate, of course, uh, only uh, a zealot. I could possibly imagine that it was a mandate. We had a once in a generation, sometimes they called it a once in a lifetime, uh, mm. referendum, uh, yes or no, asking the Scottish people if they wanted to uh, leave or stay. Uh, but the dichotomy was yes and no, and the nationalists were fighting for the yes. And despite all of the prevailing conditions, being in their favor. The year, the 700th anniversary of Braveheart and, uh, and uh, Robert the Bruce, the Battle uh, of Bannockburn. The question, yes, no, rather than leave, remain. Uh, the franchise, only people living in Scotland, aged 16 or over, were allowed to vote. So the captain of the Scotland football team wasn't allowed to vote because, of course, he's playing for Liverpool or Manchester United or Arsenal or Tottenham and living in London. So he didn't get a vote. But the captain of the Lithuanian football team, who was briefly living in Scotland, he did get a vote. 16-year-olds were allowed to vote, while the voting age 
for all other elections is 18. Uh, despite all of the prevailing conditions, being in the favor of the separatists who wish to partition this small island, they lost on an 85% turnout by 55 to 45. So my view is simple. You said it was going to be once in a generation. That's the very least that it can be, once in a generation. Six years is not a generation, even for domestic rabbits. Let's go to the news with Jamie Lowe. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Sputnik News. COVID restrictions in England will get tougher if rules are not followed, Britain's Health Secretary has warned, as the government introduces £10,000 fines for people who fail to self-isolate. Matt Hancock said the country was facing a tipping point. If everyone follows the rules, then we can avoid a further national lockdown, he said. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson is understood to be considering a ban on households mixing and reducing opening hours for pubs. Asked if England could face another national lockdown, Hancock said, I don't rule it out. I don't want to see it. The move, under consideration by Johnson, could take the form of a two-week mini-lockdown in England, being referred to as a circuit breaker in an aim to stem a recent surge in cases. On Saturday, a further 4,422 new COVID-19 cases and 27 deaths were reported in the UK. Visitors have flocked to Blackpool despite police warning against having a last blast in the resort before tighter restrictions come into force. People reported queues for attractions, heavy traffic and little social distancing and few people wearing masks indoors. Lancashire will be subject to tighter restrictions from Tuesday after significant increases in COVID-19 cases but Blackpool is exempt. Police had said they were preparing for large crowds over the weekend. Singapore is distributing thousands of devices that can track where a person has been and who they've interacted with. The small Bluetooth device is meant for those who do not own smartphones and cannot use a contact tracing app that was previously rolled out by the Singapore government. While there are some concerns over data protection, authorities say the token helps vulnerable groups feel safer when out and about. Australia looks set to record its lowest daily coronavirus increase for three months with just 18 new cases reported so far. The state of Victoria, the epicentre of the country's COVID-19 outbreak, recorded 14 new infections to Sunday morning, down from 21 the day before. New South Wales and Queensland reported two cases each. The remaining states are yet to report their figures, but rarely record any new cases. Figures were last this low on June 23rd. Victoria's Premier Daniel Andrews said the numbers were cause for great optimism. His state, which has accounted for 75% of Australia's 26,900 cases and 90% of its 849 deaths, has been under lockdown since early July. Melbourne, the state capital, has been under tighter restrictions than any other areas, including a curfew and stay-at-home orders. Anti-lockdown protests in the city have become a regular sight. Earlier today, demonstrators gathered in the central business district. Saturday's protests in the park saw protesters being dispersed by police on horseback. Just one in 10 of the world's population is likely to be protected against COVID-19 in the first year of a vaccine being made available, according to scientists. Analysts of global manufacturing capacity shows just 2 billion doses could be made in 2021, even if a vaccine was given the green light by safety regulators at the start of the year. But with seven of the nine prototype vaccines in late stage clinical trials requiring two doses, that's likely to be enough to immunize only a little over 12% of the 7.8 billion people who need it. U.S. President Donald Trump has said he will this week nominate a woman to replace the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, escalating a political row over her successor, 
Ginsburg, who was 87, died on Friday just under two months before the US elections. Trump's Democratic rival Joe Biden insists the decision on her replacement should wait until after the vote. The ideological balance of the nine-member court is crucial to its rulings on the most important issues in US law. Trump has vowed to swear in Ginsburg's successor without delay, a move that's infuriated Democrats who fear Republicans will vote to lock in a decades-long conservative majority on the country's highest court. Ginsburg had also made her feelings clear in the days before her death. My fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed, she wrote in a statement to her granddaughter. A package containing rice and poison that was addressed to President Donald Trump has been intercepted before it reached the White House. The letter was discovered at a screening facility for White House mail earlier this week, officials said. They said a substance found inside the envelope was identified as ricin, a poison found naturally in castor beans. The Trump administration is yet to comment on the reports. Airstrikes on a Taliban base in northeastern Afghanistan have killed at least a dozen civilians. The twin Afghan strikes in Kunduz come as the country's government and the Taliban hold talks to reach a peace settlement. Provincial officials and a Taliban spokesperson said at least 12 civilians were killed and more than 10 injured. A defence ministry spokesperson claimed that more than 40 Taliban fighters were also killed in the strikes. The Taliban, however, did not confirm whether there were any casualties amongst its fighters. And finally, a football match was disrupted by an unusual pitch invader when an alpaca bounded onto the field. Carlton Athletic's tie against Ilkley Town in West Yorkshire on Saturday was halted for 15 minutes when Oscar the alpaca escaped from a nearby farm and joined the action. Attempts were made to entice it off the pitch with food before a farm managed to shepherd it home. Carlton is renowned in the league for having alpacas nearby. Ilkley manager Simon Armstrong said after 35 minutes it escaped, came through the entrance and proceeded to get on the pitch. The referee stopped the game. Carlton Athletic said farm animals had been kept near the pitch for several years, but it was the first time one had managed to stop a match. Club chairman John Flynn said, I don't know how he got out, there must be a little gap in the barrier somewhere, as we've seen some chickens here as well. Oscar the alpaca is reportedly very inquisitive and appeared to be enjoying himself, running up and down down the pitch. A couple of players even said he should be the man of the match. And that's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Now, here's the second poll. Assuming, because I know we're not going to buy the Russian vaccine, because that would be too much to bear. I'm getting it, but you won't be offered it. Who should get any vaccine that we do produce? Who should get it first? A, health staff, B, the old and infirm, C, by lottery. This will short the sheep from the goats. This will show the Malthusians. Answer that one. Who should get it first? Health staff, the old and the infirm, or by lottery? You can vote on my Twitter feed. Now, I did start off by saying, and you'll have seen that I... Uh, won't be in this studio with anyone else without my mask on. I've got it off now because I'm alone in the uh, studio. Uh, Ranjit Bra, doctor, physician, surgeon, has helped us through this crisis, and we're sticking with him. But he, even he must be getting anxious as these numbers begin to mount. Let's see if I'm right. Dr. Ranjit, thank you again for uh, joining us. Numbers are pretty bleak, aren't they? George, good to be back with you. Um, yes, George, there's no, there's no question that um, uh, the much feared second wave essentially is upon us uh, and upon us um, across Europe, probably. Um, as we saw Italy showing, uh, being ahead of the, uh, us by about three weeks um, in the February, March, April period. Uh, we can probably see that Spain is about six weeks ahead of us and France about three weeks ahead of us. But we are very much following the trajectory uh, of their rise in numbers of infections. Yesterday we had test proven uh, four and a half 
thousand infections. It seems likely now that there are 70 or 80 thousand people who currently are infected in Britain. Um, those rates have doubled over the period of a week, and that's seen in a lot of other indices as well. Uh, so the rates of hospitalization are starting to increase. Um, our rates of hospitalization, uh, again, essentially doubled. Uh, our death rates uh, have essentially doubled. They were, you know, for three or four weeks, they've been quite low over the last part of the summer. Though actually, if you uh, total them up and look back in retrospect, there were probably no days when there were zero deaths. And the weekly average was running between 50 and 70. Uh, that doubled over the last week. And sadly, we've had 136 people who have died uh, of coronavirus, not with it, of coronavirus over the last week. So all of these numbers are doubling. Um, and probably we're having, as I say, four and a half thousand cases a day. But it's the, it's the rate of increase that, that is most worrying. And uh, there's kind of a many sources and many uh, data um, uh, measures are showing essentially that within a couple of weeks time we could be uh, back into a similar situation uh, as in March um, uh, on a rising, exponentially rising uh, number of cases, George. Now, uh, the evidence that I have seen from Europe, which as you say is ahead of us as they were in the beginning, uh, it hit there before it hit here. Uh, more fool us for not uh, taking the breathing space that we were thus offered uh, to get ourselves in better shape to deal with this. But there's some evidence, isn't there, uh, that though cases are rising rapidly uh, on the European continent, uh, that death rates are not following them. Uh, there is some evidence, therefore, that this second wave is less fatal, less deadly uh, than the first wave. And we must hope and pray that that is true, of course. First of all, is it, in your view, likely to be true? And secondly, what if it isn't? What if we are back to a thousand people a day dying uh, of coronavirus? How are we going to cope with that? Uh, I think that those are both reasonable questions, George. And, um, uh, you know, I, as I was saying, I don't think there's a fundamental difference between the virus, but I think that the way that our countries have um, reorganized to cope with the virus has changed significantly. Obviously, you know, the first time around, we had virtually no ability to test. Uh, that had to be ramped up from zero all over the place. Some countries did that very effectively, some very uh, poorly. Um, it's true that a certain, the most, perhaps the most vulnerable section of the society um, has caught the virus. And so we're likely to have slightly uh, more resilient uh, population overall. However, there are still very many millions who have not had the virus who are susceptible. So there's certainly, this pandemic has a long way to run if le left unchecked. Of course, it's not being totally left unchecked. We do have tracing. We do have tracking and um, other countries have shown it's possible both to you know get on top of the first wave and get on top of the second wave the ones who did it very successfully the first time around we've talked about before um, the Korean Peninsula did extremely well China did extremely well other countries like New Zealand did extremely well um, China essentially eradicated the virus and has returned to normal and shows no sign of an appreciable second wave having had a high level of vigilance through very good well-coordinated public testing measures and social isolation. Um, on this second wave, countries like Japan, Germany, again, South Korea, have done well at essentially getting on top of the virus early and therefore minimizing its impact uh, on us all. Um, you know, un unfortunately, um, all the evidence so far is that our testing and tracing program remains very poor. The numbers are much higher, but the numbers of people who are tested is about half the number of tests performed. Um, and so some people are getting two tests. Yeah, that, that's right. They're, they're double counting uh, in, in many respects. Sometimes it was swab still being taken from the nose and the mouth and be counted as two tests. So all of these um, things uh, can confound the numbers slightly. 
Equally, uh, in particular, our, our, our tracing system we've talked about many times, uh, as you know, uh, Dido Harding, who is a former chief executive of Talk Talk Group, a, a dame and very connected to our current administration and, and is a very establishment figure, has been put in charge of this without any appreciable um, acumen in this, in this department or any particular qualifications. All of the money which is being pumped into this uh, increasing amount of money which is being pumped into this field uh, is not being run via the NHS. It's not the NHS capacity, which has been expanded to deal with all of these medical problems. Rather, the axes continue to be wielded on the NHS, and all of this money is being pushed privately into Group 4 Securities, Serco, uh, the Big Four uh, market, uh, accountancy groups, all of these um, and, and other private providers. Uh, the Lighthouse Laboratories, famously for the testing, and they're very large centres. So it's not the local expertise of the National Health Service which is being increased in capacity and increased in funding. Rather, it continues to be starved of resources. More and more money is going into the private sector who are not performing adequately. And we know that probably uh, only a fifth of the people who are being contacted, perhaps half of the people who um, have a positive test, uh, half of those contacts are traced. And we know of those half who are traced, only a fifth are actually self-isolating, largely because many of them are, uh, are unable economically to stop. Well, uh, that, that, that brings me on to, uh, in a way, my main question to you now. Uh, according to Boris Johnson, people who are told to self-isolate are going to be fined up to £10,000 if they don't do it. Um, First of all, how are we going to know that they didn't do it? Who's in charge of finding out that they didn't do it? And is £10,000 a realistic amount of money to find someone who's broken their quarantine because they desperately had to go to work because they can't live uh, on the current uh, stipend that they have? Well, I think all of those points are, are, are absolutely spot on. Um, no one is going to be able to uh, find the vast majority of people who are unable to uh, self-isolate. Um, there's no social provision. There's no monetary provision. There's no place that is uh, given to them where they can isolate from society. That was why, <laughs> I hate to say the same thing again and again, that was why China was able to eradicate the virus after about 80,000 cases and they had less than half um, of one hundredth of one percent of their population have had the virus um, because they prov provided social support, they provided social isolation from where, a social place where the, where the population who were positive could isolate. From there, they could be nursed back to health and after several tests discharged back into the community or if they deteriorated, could rapidly access good, you know, gold standard healthcare, including ventilation and whatever medications are available. Um, so those measures are not in place. We've given huge amounts of money to um, a private sector who are unable to carry on with their normal private practice, just essentially to keep their doors open uh, without them providing any service. We haven't used even those private hospitals to put people who, for example, have tested positive uh, and need isolation uh, in a place where they can get adequate medical and social care. So no, we won't, they won't be able to do so. Uh, you know, the, the concept that now an app will be launched and that everyone will get on it if their reward is going to be a £10,000 fine when they're unable to follow the advice because there's no actual provision made for them, you know, uh, you can see why these measures are as ineffective in our society and why British uh, and American society, you know, the laissez-faire free market fundamentalist economic model, generating so much wealth from so much of the world, having taken money hand over fist from so much of the world is still able to un unable to provide for such a, a large proportion of our own populations and why the indices of social deprivation in our countries are spiraling out of control now george lastly and i'm grateful for your time as always where do we stand on vaccine am i right in assuming uh, that we will not be buying the russian vaccine even though uh, it is uh, on the face of it a success story uh, many other countries are uh, asking for it and being given it. Uh, I'm presuming we won't uh, because uh, Britain hates Russia and America hates Russia and America hates China. They, ho they hate both. So do we. Uh, so uh, our own, I say our own loosely, it'll be owned by a multinational drug company. Our own vaccine, when is it happening? 
a very good question, George. Of course, um, I, I don't. I'm sure you don't uh, hate uh, the Russian or Chinese people. On the contrary, have a great uh, admiration and respect. Uh, you could even say love of the of the great things that these uh, nations, as as other nations, have given to the world. Um, and I'm sure even our own government wouldn't put it crudely in that way. But essentially, you're right. They have a deep uh, enmity and geopolitical rivalry, both the British government and the American government is dominating the American election, uh, whether they emphasize, you know, when, when Trump was asked questions recently um, uh, about Russian interference, he even said, you know, it's, it's China you've got to be worrying about at the moment. So they, they, they're conflicted themselves as to who is the biggest bogeyman, who is their biggest uh, rival, uh, whether they look militarily or economically. In terms of its being an economic powerhouse, probably China, but in terms of its uh, nuclear arsenal, military capability, it's Russia, and of course the two are now very closely aligned in opposing the interventionism uh, and aggressive nature of U.S. and British um, military presence in their in their regions and in the world and their economically uh, economic strategy. So yes, I think it's in a highly unlikely um, that this. Uh, vaccine, which has been shown to be safe, but as yet is basically going through an extended phase three trial of a large uh, part of the population in Russia elsewhere, which has been um, essentially promised in uh, in millions and hundreds of millions of doses to different countries around the world. Our own country, which has bought up um, you know hundreds of millions of doses from very many companies, uh, has shown no interest in acquiring that. A vaccine, though it is proved uh, as efficacious and more efficacious than others, and has been the first to grant license. But people, you know, justly say it's been grant, grant, granted license during the period of its phase three trial. Essentially, it's showing excellent data. All the data that we have, and I've, and I've reviewed that uh, paper in the Lancet, uh, shows that it's extremely efficacious and safe. Of course, when you're giving something in hundreds of millions of doses, you need to have very robust safety data because even a very small element of being unsafe can translate into disastrous consequences. So this is a, you know, a reasonable criticism which is held up. However, it is unreasonable that there will be no interest shown in this um, vaccine, which so far has proven to be one of the best, amongst the best candidates in the world. And yes, it is being rolled out um, in Russia, uh, and other countries. The, the Chinese also have a vaccine which they're rolling out to certain groups, high-risk groups, and within their military in their own country. Um, and these are the front runners. So the front runners are from the, the geopolitical bloc, which is our rival, and it's unquestionably the case that we will be denied access to those, uh, at least in the first instance, that the main um, uh, uh, va vaccines that we're backing are the GlaxoSmithKline Oxford vaccine, uh, which was temporarily halted due to safety concerns, but it only lasted about a week and has been and that, that trial is ongoing. Um, and uh, America's uh, so-called warp speed uh, program from uh, uh, from from their major ph pharmaceutical companies. So those um, uh, vaccines trials are ongoing. Uh, licenses are not expected to be granted this year. Um, so. It's going to, be a long, going to be a long, cold winter then for, uh, cold. for the uh, coronavirus. I think that's right. And I think we're, we're essentially in the same situation where we are left with the tried and tested public health measures as our only measure to combat this. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's failure to implement adequate health measures of our government and the United States government is what's leaving us in this ongoing situation. And I do understand there's a degree of skepticism, there's, un there's a degree of fatigue with this question, there's a degree of hostility to the government which translates into a disbelief in the, pre the very existence of this virus. The virus is real, the threat is real, I'm afraid the curve is increasing and we are going to see a second wave. And what we should remember is the, it's the inadequacy of our government to institute adequate health measures which is leaving us in the situation where possibly our, our liberties will be increasingly infringed. We know 13 million people are already under some form of partial lockdown, and it increasingly looks the case that it's being signaled that there'll be an increasing lockdown, perhaps over the, the half-term bank holiday. Certainly, we're expecting the peak of this um, by, uh, uh, by, by the end of October and November period, George. Dr. Ranji, thanks as always on the coronavirus. We never really get on to other health matters because of the gravity uh, of the situation. Dan works with me here uh, through the glass. You can, you can see him, but he's got a mask on. I'll need to put mine on uh, also because 
uh, the Russians are very strict about uh, these uh, protocols. Can you still hear me? I hope you can still hear me. Dan has, with some of his friends, one of whom is me, has launched a demand for a coronavirus tax on the very wealthiest people in the country. What's not to love about that? Dan, thanks for uh, uh, agreeing to uh, stay a few minutes. Um, tell people why we should have such a tax, who it would be on, and what sort of money it would yield and what we could do with that money. Well, this tax is very specifically aimed at the very wealthy. And they only represent actually a tiny proportion of the population. We're saying anyone with a personal fortune of 10 million or over. Which, 10 million. Yeah, that's only... So even most lottery winners wouldn't have to pay this tax. Exactly. And, you know, that's some 20,000 people in the UK um, that have a wealth of over 10 million. And we're saying a wealth tax, not an income tax. Uh, we're proposing this as a one-off wealth tax. Uh, and that would generate somewhere in the region between if you take the very lowest thresholds as a, a minimum of uh, some 15,000 people that have over 10 million, and then an even smaller minority, about 4,500 that have over 80 million pounds in personal wealth, that would generate well over 17 billion, probably in the region of 25 billion, if you just take the minimum thresholds of those two figures. So that would be 5% one-off tax on people who have a personal fortune uh, of between 10 million pounds and what? So over, over 10 million pounds is the, is the blanket. Everybody right. over, who's worth over uh, 10 million pounds would have to pay the 5% one-off coronavirus tax. Exactly. And, you know, that would put... That seems reasonable to me. Uh, can, could anyone dispute that? Well, if you won 10 million on the lottery, would you really be that upset to give 500,000 pounds to make you know, your community in the country a little bit better. Well, exactly. To support the NHS. It. Yeah, so a good way of putting it. And this money surgery. would go into public health? Well, Is yeah, that your plan? We think this should be spent on public health, infrastructure, jobs. I mean, we're looking at now uh, official unemployment figures creeping up to 3 million. And that's not including people that are struggling in part-time work, not able to find enough work. And even people that are working suffering from in-work poverty. So we think this should be used to um, support our NHS, support infrastructure, support the creation of jobs. And this would, you know, move some of that capital that's not doing anything at the moment. It's all locked up in... Yeah, I mean, what are they doing, or, what are they doing with that 5% anyway? They, they, they've got 10 million. They're not going to miss 5% of it as a one-off. And where is it anyway? It's sitting in a bank or in property or in jewellery or Bitcoin or wherever they've got it. It's mind-boggling. I mean, there's only, you know, a certain amount you need to live on and, you know, how much ever you can spend on luxuries and, you know, how many Not super limits, yachts yeah. and private jets, you know, do people need? Good and point. This, this country is really struggling at the moment. Now, how, how do people uh, support this campaign? I'm fully behind it myself. Well, they can go to coronatax.org or look up workerspartybritain.org. So we're campaigning for the Labour Party, actually, to adopt this position. And You're demanding Sir Keir Starmer uh, demand it of the government. Well, they... Is that because you thought there was no point in going directly to the government? Or because you've got a lot of confidence in Sir Keir Starmer? Well, uh, they're meant to be the opposition. So, you know, we really want to say the opposition should put forward Oppose, things yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, the interests of the people have at heart. And uh, over 61% of people apparently support the idea of a wealth tax. So I'd, I'd be embarrassed personally to call myself a member of the party if they didn't support this policy. Very interesting. A one-off 5% coronavirus tax on people worth more than £10 million. Uh, actually, if I was worth over £10 million, I'd be embarrassed to uh, oppose it. I'd, I'd write you the check uh, for the 5%. Dan, thanks uh, very My much uh, for that. Uh, the coronavirus tax campaign. Sounds like a good one uh, to me. Who should get the vaccine first? Health staff, 47. The old and the infirm, 47. By lottery, just 6%. Well done, you. Well done, uh, you who reject the idea 
of Malthus. You can vote now on my Twitter feed, at George Galloway. You can call in now if you want to talk about the vaccine and who should get it. I'll remind you of the number, 02077 982 255. Or if you're in the US, 001-757-744-4480. Let me take a 60-second break. Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a regular segment called Criminal Injustice about the most egregious conduct of our courts and how justice is denied to so many people in this country. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Thursday and every Thursday for thorough and independent analysis of our criminal injustice system. Well, um... How did I do? I'm sorry, Prime Minister. At no point did you drive on the left-hand side of the road, and instead of driving us forward, you made several U-turns. We haven't gone anywhere. Well, uh, I think you'll find if you turn backwards uh, enough times, eventually uh, you'll go forward. So, uh, did I pass? No, you failed. Miserably. But my teachers said I'd get much higher grades. Better luck next time. Uh, this doesn't happen to people uh, like me. You leave me no choice. I'm sorry, but rules are rules, even for Prime Ministers. What on earth is that? My mutant pet. <laughs> Dominic Cummins. No. Big algorithm. Get it. <laughs> Global higher education. With one of the world's best known iconoclasts. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. Now, health staff, 45%. That's uh, what, who people think should get the vaccine first. I'd vote for the health staff because then we have them in place to treat the rest of us. But that's down to B is the old and infirm, 47, and by lottery is up 2 to 8%. Uh, Jason in Kidderminster is on the line. Let's hear from him. Jason. Hello, George. How is it going? All good, by the grace of God. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, well, before I make my main point, I just want to say that the rule of six, the, there is an exception, if you've heard, for people who shoot grouse, which is <laughs> absolutely... And, and I'm not making this up, it's <laughs> honestly true, but... Uh, you There's know, an that, exception that, to the group of six for people who shoot grouse. Yeah, honest to God. How, I, how many, how many are they allowed to gather in? I'm, I'm not, not sure. I think it might be 30, but I'm not sure. Right, I know there goodness. is definitely an exception. And why can't but, six men shoot grouse just as effectively? As 60. I, I, I imagine it's because uh, I think something to do with the environmental. Maybe they need the peasants that go beating, beating right. the ground uh, to, <laughs> yeah. to, to make the grouse uh, rise. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they'd have to beat the ground themselves and we couldn't have that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they couldn't do that, <laughs> could they? But my, my main point really is basically my cousin. Her girlfriend was tested for the coronavirus, and, uh, and, and she was positive. And then she went back home, and, and basically, I think there's a massive flaw in the system, because what it's saying here, and I'm on the NHS website, it says that if you live with someone who is tested positive, then you should then self-isolate for 14 days. But the problem is, it literally doesn't explicitly say that all those people should get a test. And it also says that the person who's tested positive should stay away from the rest of the household. So the flaw, I think, is if, say, someone in my household's tested positive, then I could get, catch the virus off those five days later, for example. And then, but... Like, then I would have to self-isolate. You see where I'm going? Yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. Very you know, good and point. I think it's actually a massive flaw because really what should happen is you should have a test, say, two days before 
the end of your 14-day isolation. Because what they're doing is, if one person in your house tests positive, they're assuming that every single person in that house has got it. And as we know, uh, uh, the majority of people are asymptomatic. So that you could get it off someone in your household five days after they've tested positive, you know, and then, and then you're going out. You know, it's uh, not. No, it's it's, it's not half a, a shambles, Jason. Thanks for the uh, the call. Now, uh, back by popular demand, and I mean popular demand on fa on uh, YouTube. It's Chris in Colchester who's got a new theory. Chris, welcome back. I'm not that popular, am I? Yeah, you people have been demanding you all night. Well, you've got a fan but... club. <laughs> hey. They're not then. They're not my theories, though, are they? They they come from uh, from epidemiologists like Cole Hennigan and Sunitra Gupta. Sunitra Gupta was on BBC Question Time this week. Yeah, I mean, Cole you were Hennigan. saying she was she couldn't get on the mainstream media, but I was just going to make that point to you, uh, which you've well, done she, prophylactically yourself. She was on BBC Question Time. Yeah, but she can't get on your show. No, but she got on BBC Question Time, which is well, good, admittedly good a much the, smaller audience. Uh, but yes, we'll get her on, Chris. Well, good for the BBC. I mean, Andrew Marr tore uh, Matthew Hancock to, to pieces this morning. That um, sounds unlikely like, to me. Andrew Marr well, has never, never torn anyone to pieces. Well, it's not difficult to t turn Matthew Hancock to no, pieces quite, because he's, an, quite, he's a lying imbecile. Quite. Um, and, you, you know, he, he ties himself in pieces. But um, we've seen this weekend there's been reports that one third of COVID deaths in July and August uh, were caused from other illnesses. Um, and, and like I said last in week... In July and August? Yep. Where was that reported, Chris? Uh, the Telegraph, the Mail... Okay, go on. And uh, and and the test, like I said last week, we're we're relying on these tests, these PCR tests that um, uh, are quite unreliable. Uh, they're very sensitive, picking up the dead virus. So we have to. What, ask, what else can ask, we do but rely on the test? Well, I, I don't think we should be doing mass testing. Um, no. No, I, I, I don't. You support so. the you support the herd immunity, don't you? Well, it, it's been, herd immunity has been given a dirty name because of... Uh, because of, because of uh, Malthus. Because of, because of Dominic Cummings? No, Thomas Malthus, who basically said, let the devil take the hindmost. We've got too many people anyway. Too many old well, people. Yeah, They're but, too much of a burden. Well, no, but, uh, but that's not, obviously not my view, is it? I want to protect the elderly. And... Um, <laughs> That, that is the view of Sinatra Gupta as well. Uh, anyway, you said you had a new theory. Tell me your new theory. Well, I'm, these are my theories. Oh. What, what, I didn't have a new... I don't, know, I don't have these theories. It's not, it's not me coming up with theories. It's people... Uh, you know, Dr. Bra is coming up with theories that there's going to be a second wave. Carl no, Hennigan said no. there's no... Well, uh, to, there's to, a, to be fair, he is a surgeon and a doctor, and he is uh, giving us the... Facts that thousands of people a day are now testing positive for coronavirus. Uh, dead yeah, you... people are doubling. Uh, hospitalized people are doubling. Number of people on ventilators has tripled. Uh, this is not a theory. This is a fact, Chris. Yeah, but you don't have to act. You act like everything he's saying. He's coming live from the Mount Sinai, like he's broadcasting from there. You can challenge what he says. Carl Hennigan is far more qualified than Dr. Bra. He's a top epidemiologist. And is he saying that these people are not in hospital? No. That they're no, not dying? No. no, of course not. No, of course not. But there's more people dying from flu in the last few months. Well, um, then, but that, that's on top of the virus. All yeah, these other things the, are killing people on top of the coronavirus. Well, the lockdown deaths are more severe. Lockdown's going to kill more people than coronavirus. Well, that, no, you're on a better point there, uh, Chris. Uh, you're definitely on a better point there. Anyway, you're backed by public demand. Philip in Leeds is also eagerly anticipated. Go ahead, Philip. Hello, George. Nice to be on. Thank you. What's your um, theory? George, You've got a theory. My oh, my my theory is a, a, a deep, dark, and suspicious theory. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
I, I'm not a cynic by nature, but I'm being dragged into cynicism and by the relentless. It happens. It can happen, Philip. It's happened to me a few uh, times yeah. in my life. <laughs> uh, dragged into cynicism. George. <laughs> dragged in. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, look, I think we need to disabuse ourselves of this sort of naive belief that... Um, the government's priority is everybody's well-being. I'm not for a moment suggesting that the opposite is the case, but I think we need to look at sure. what we're actually... Yeah. Well, I wouldn't send this guy, government out for a loaf, never mind to look after my public health. <laughs> I wouldn't trust them at the price of a loaf, George. Mm. Um, the, the, the problem is uh, people reveal themselves by their, by their character, by their, their, sorry, they reveal their character by their choices and actions. And I was looking at the way they farm the testing out to these, you know, sort of crony capitalist private companies. They didn't ask the NHS, who might actually know what they were doing. They didn't ask the military, who are used to doing big, sudden projects and getting it right nine times out of ten. And, and the, the net result of what's happening is the numbers are spiking. This is not getting better, and the country is getting dragged further and further in, into recession. Now, the part that's making me cynical is people like myself and probably you, George, understand that recession is, in fact, a huge opportunity for the wealthy. Well, for and some people, sections, yeah. Yeah, and people with money, when, when things get bad... You can snap up property, property and you can even and buy shares. assets and yeah. so on. Of course, I yeah. get that, yeah. And, 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 and look, people who have the money to buy at the bottom of the market make huge profits at the top of the market. Yeah. And I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to be ultra cynical about this, but I, I do think that there are benefits for a certain section of society. Uh, for a certain section, really but not, not for the ruling elite as a whole. Uh, not for capitalism no. as a whole. Uh, the big losers no. on assets crashing and being picked up at the bottom of the market are themselves capitalists. Absolutely. And I think, I think they're the entrepreneurial capitalists. What you see is the layer above them of people who have sort of family money. Um, I don't want to use names. People like, for example, David Cameron, who has family money. I'm not suggesting he's done anything improper. But people, people, people of that ilk. Um, I'm suggesting he's are, are, done are lots position. of things improper. In fact, he's a complete <laughs> scoundrel. <laughs> Phil, Philip, I'm, you're not cynical I'm so enough. I'm, I'm so glad that you said it, man. I, I, I didn't have to. Um, but, but I think there's people of that class who do very well out of this. The people who invest, the people who don't get their hands dirty, um, who have money to invest and who trade in people's lives and who trade in property. I agree with you. Entrepreneurs, people who actually make things, they'll suffer very badly yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, but, It's about time they, the, it's about the, time they stood they're, up they're, for themselves yeah. uh, a bit more yeah. robustly. Uh, before they yeah. uh, end up uh, on the breadline like uh, so many uh, already yeah. are and it's likely to yeah. get much worse. Philip, that was a terrific call. Uh, don't be a stranger. Keep uh, calling back, uh, won't you? I need to take one last 60-second break. Stop banging on the toilet door, Amber. Stop banging on the toilet door. You're gonna frighten the pilot. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you when we land. Although that could take a considerable amount of time. expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Global higher education, with one of the world's best-known iconoclasts, the mother of all talk shows, with George Galloway. Now, in response to the poll, Trudy says, no one should get the vaccine as it may be unsafe, as it's not being tested enough, and there's no legal comeback if you get ill from it. And Georgie says, a very tricky question. I devised it that way. Initially, I thought elderly and the infirm, but I voted for healthcare workers, not to selfishly protect myself as one, but to ensure we're about to look after 
to ensure that we are about to look after everyone else. If we shield vulnerable people properly, undertake functional track and trace, that group may escape COVID. Ah, if, as Bill Clinton would put it, it depends what you mean by if. Stuart in Rougely wants to talk about China. I'm always up for that. Stuart, go ahead, sir. Hello, uh, George. Pleased to speak to you. I've always been a, a big admirer all day. I'm not getting this loud and clear. Is everyone else? Oh, sorry. Go on, Hang Stuart. On. That's better. OK, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've always been a great admirer of yours, but I don't think you will be after, after what I've got to say. <laughs> um, can, I, can, I, can I just say that we, we Brits actually don't hate China or Russia, but we do hate their governments. Why, why, hate... why do you hate them? What have they ever done to you, Stuart? The Russian, Russian people haven't done anything to me. And they, they were absolutely sterling in the war, and we couldn't have won the war without them. Uh, but the thing is, what we do is we hate dictators. Sorry? We hate dictators like Putin. Putin is a horrible, he a dictator? horrible how is, Stuart, how is he a dictator? He's a dictator because he's just manipulated the law so that he can be... Re, uh, re elected but, in inverted commas. But he'd only be re elected as long if. As he wants. But, but Stuart, hang on, Stuart hang on, no, man. I'll let you back in. I just want to point out a rather obvious flaw in what you're saying. He could only be re elected if the majority of people voted for him. And if they voted for him, he wouldn't be a dictator. Yes, yes, and I appreciate the point, and you're absolutely right. However, he's manipulated the law so that he can have himself put in a place for re-election. But and Stuart, that, how long... But a, a British Prime Minister can be re-elected for 50 years, for the rest of their life, as long as they get re-elected. No, 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 George, no, George. His party can be re-elected on a manifesto. You can change Prime Ministers as many times well, you as can, you like. You can, and, and we badly do. need to and do so and now. And My gets, point to you, Stuart, is there are no term limits to how long you can be the Prime Minister of Britain. And there's certainly no time limits, as Her Majesty is proving, for how long you can be the head of state in Britain. Yeah, but she was born into the job. That's the difference. She ah, wasn't. Ah, Stuart, you're not seriously <laughs> saying she was born into the job. That's different. No, I don't think it's different. It is. How is anyway. it different? How? I can't let you away. How she, is it she different? Had, she, she had no choice. Putin manipulated... We have no power. choice. <laughs> we have no choice. She's the head of state, whether we like it or not. Putin is the, the elected president the of Russia. So, yes, yes, and he was, and he was elected. But the point is, they had a law that said you could only do so many terms, yeah. and you hit that, and then they had and a then you came to Well, because they had a referendum to again. scrap that. But the point I'm making to you, we don't have an elected head of state, and neither do we have term limits on how long you can be the prime minister for. So neither of those two complaints of yours make him a dictator. Uh, well, uh, again... Again, with his kleptocracy, mate, who... who That's a different about. matter. I'm against kleptocracy. Uh, uh, There's yeah, quite a yeah. few kleptocrats just along the road from me here. You don't need to yeah. be a Russian to be a kleptocrat, Stuart. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> you, I, I'm, surprised, I'm surprised you didn't say Boris and Kova. But as well, I'd like to mention... Well, I, 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 I need to let you go because now because of the hour. Stuart, tell me this. Where is Rougely? Rusley is right in the middle of Staffordshire. It, it's about eight miles from Cannock, Lichfield, Excellent. and Stafford. Excellent. Right in the middle. We good used man. to have a power station. Yeah, good man. Um, you've uh, educated me tonight on that, at least. John is in Benidorm. Now, I'm not going to say hello, I wish... Hello, George. I'm not going to say I wish I was in Benidorm, because that would be untrue. But I'm very glad to hear <laughs> from you. Yeah, Betty Dome's uh, divided into two areas, the civilised area and the not-so-civilised uh, area. Now, tell me, is it the British that live in the civilised area? No, I do, and so, uh, quite a few British do, but it's mainly Spanish, 
the holiday flats, what they use for between four and eight weeks a year, and they're empty for the rest of the year. Now, you were poorly the last time I spoke to you. You were in the hospital. Are you better now? Yeah, I had COVID, and then I had a double heart uh, Jesus. heart uh, operation, which I got over, and I'm much better now. Thank excellent. you. Excellent, excellent. Very glad to hear but it, I just, First of all, I'd just like to comment on the health situation in Spain, because it's worse than England. Yeah, it's ahead of us, two, two three weeks maybe. Yeah. Uh, at the end of July, the Spanish government made you wear masks everywhere on the streets, on transport, in the shops, everywhere you go, you've got to wear a mask. It doesn't matter where you are. And since they've done that, the Spanish COVID incidents uh, have gone up the most in Europe. So, it hasn't, so it, that hasn't it, worked. It, it the hasn't, masks haven't worked the best, in Spain. It hasn't made any difference. Mm. Well, that's very, and, very unfortunate. Yeah, well, m most of the Spanish people in Benidorm now have gone back to Madrid. M Madrid has got the highest amount of infection in uh, in Europe, and it's been under lockdown. It's, they're half under lockdown starting Monday, but if the figures don't improve, it will be under complete lockdown, and the whole of Spain will be under lockdown before November. Oh, dear, dear, dear. John, stay safe. I know that uh, they've uh, looked after you well there, but uh, let's uh, try and keep you out of hospital uh, if we can. Rashid is in Long Beach. Now, there I'd like to be. He wants to talk about Donald Trump. Go ahead, Rashid. Hey, George. I just wanted to bring the attention to your listeners about the revelations uh, from a recent book by Bob Woodward about... Uh, a uh, attempted soft coup by some of the generals, particularly uh, Mr. Mad Dog Mattis, who was Secretary of Defense at the time. Yeah, he turns uh, out only to be he turns out to be not so mad after all. <laughs> well, it, it could be uh, not so mad. Don't forget that was the same gentleman who led the destruction of Fallujah, Indeed. where he had no no that was mad. Uh, reluctance. Yeah. That was no reluctance to tie. That was rabbit. Yeah, no reluctance, no reluctance to tie civilians on tanks and uh, personnel carriers to protect American troops. Yeah. So that's the kind of virtuous human being that is supposedly leading an Why effort internal Trump within keep, the United States. Why does Trump appointing these types uh, when he? Well, first of all, they turn against him and are trying their best to destroy him, and secondly, they stand for. The precise opposite of what he claimed in the election campaign himself to stand for. Well, he's, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell you the details because I'm not into that, but I, my speculation simply, he's such a total outsider. He, he assumed the Republican establishment represented Main Street when the Republican establishment represents uh, Wall Street and the military-industrial complex. Yeah. And they're never going to let that cash cow go away. And to be promoted, whether you're in the military, whether you're in the judiciary, whether you're in the legislature, you have to join that team. Anybody who's not part of that team mm. gets pushed out. Yeah. So and you've so read the, the Woodward Mr. book. Were you impressed? By Mr. Woodward's book? Yeah. Or by the attempt to... Mr. Woodward's an insider. His job is political smash-up. So as needed, he'll write dirt. As needed, he'll write something positive. Mm -hmm. But I'm grateful that these revelations on the internal machinations, the internal interesting warfare, is being spilled out because the public never sees this and never hears about it. And whether you're for Trump or against Trump, the fact that there's an internal attempt to dis uh, ignore the actions of uh, elected you know, uh, president should be questionable. I mean, I, I'm uh, pretty long in the tooth, and I remember the way they came after Jimmy Carter, and I remember the way they came after uh, is it Joff Whitlam in Australia. Anybody who deviates from the program has to be smashed. Yeah. And he, someone may look like an insider, but if he's even one tenth out of their frame yeah. of reference, yeah. he has to go. Just uh, in a, in a sentence, Rashid, uh, do you think Trump's going to be reelected? Uh, you know, uh, George, um, I've, uh, when I would look back at 2016 and being uh, participating in elections as an observer since 1976, uh, 
the vote rigging on the state level, on the national level, is absurd. And in 2016, the Democratic Party, the U.S. establishment, thought Hillary had it in the bag. They took their foot off the accelerator. They're not going to let that happen again. But if you go to the general population outside of the East Coast and the West Coast, he still has considerable support. Now the question is, can the vote rigging overcome the considerable support? If it's close, they can steal it. But if it's massive, they have to do their work to hide it. Rashid, thanks, uh, as always, uh, for the call. Last call, I suspect, is Lee in Grimsby, who has a theory for curing coronavirus. We better hear him. Go ahead, Lee. Hello there. Yeah, you could call it a theory, I suppose. Um, well, we start with a rhetorical question, George. Uh, do you know anybody that's never got a cold? Okay. Right. So the answer is no. Um, which means that this is probably endemic, which we're facing. Um, and therefore, the only way around this is we can't get a vaccine. We've got a vaccine for the flu, but we all know that doesn't work. People still die from the flu. So no, it, does, it does way. work. It protects a large number of people from the flu. It protects to an extent. Okay, I'll give you that. Mm. But people still die of the flu, okay? Sure. But, okay, so we've got to look at ways to get around this. And uh, a study came out. There's been a few studies, as you're probably aware of. And uh, Chicago Medical uh, produced a study the other day where they've looked at people with deficient. Okay, this is respect uh, retrospective. So this is people who were already deficient in vitamin D who then caught the coronavirus and um, struggled to, uh, to get over it. So there was a, you know, a direct link between a lack of vitamin D and, and the uh, problem with the virus, which means heading into, especially in England, a place like this, where we're going to get very little sun shortly, uh, a second wave is, I would say, um, almost certainty, certainty at this point. So what I'm saying is people need to stock up on vitamin D while they can. That's that a very good outside. advice. It's very good advice, Lee. I'm, I'm following it myself. Uh, I'm taking vitamin D supplement. Uh, I can't say I like it. I actually feel, um, although other people don't, but I actually feel a little bit sick after I take the tablet just for uh, a minute or so uh, uh, until it passes. Uh, but I figure it's far better to take the vitamin D Get as much vitamin D as you can from the sunshine. Uh, take it, uh, it's over the counter. It's not particularly expensive. Shop around, you can get it quite economically. Take your vitamin D uh, supplement. Stay as far away from as many people as you can. That much to me is obvious. If you don't get close enough to catch the virus from someone else, uh, then you'll be fine. Uh, you might be extremely unlucky and pick it up from a surface. Keep washing your hand. Keep using these sanitizers that are everywhere. There are some people you can't stay away from. You can't not kiss your wife. You cannot not hug your children. And I'm not going to stop doing that. I'd rather die uh, than do that. Uh, but as far as you can, avoid close contact contact with as many people as you can. I wear a mask, not because it's going to stop me getting it, but because it will reduce the chances of me giving it to someone else. I'm selfless uh, like that. Let's do what we can and pray to the Almighty, whom I believe in with all my heart, uh, that this second wave is not as devastating as the first one was. I know there's a lot of people out there who don't trust the state, who don't trust the mass media, don't trust the political class, and I understand that because I don't trust them either. I told you at the beginning about this extraordinary book written uh, by the ordinary wife of a very, very ordinary member of the political class. And it is a dismal read indeed. I know why the credibility of our rulers is so reduced. But this is not a capitalist conspiracy. Because for that to be true, Cuba would have to be in on it. Communist China would have to be in on it. Communist Vietnam would have to be in on it. 
and they're not. It's real. It's dangerous. May God go with you all and you stay safe enough to be back with me next week at the same time, same place. It's been marvelous. <laughs>